Let's go and see what's up with uh, Antoine. Antoine got no game. The date was so bad. You start hurrying over to where Anton is staying. If someone actually tried to poison him, this can't possibly wait. It doesn't take long to reach Anton, given your quickened pace. There's no immediate answer when you knock on the door. All you hear instead is the sound of furniture scraping around on the other side. Hmm. Didn't I give this guy a Monty voice? I think. Yeah, who goes there? Ask Anton's muffled voice from the other side of the door. You know who it is, Anton. Let me in. We don't have much time. Huh. Indeed, I do. Thank you for coming so quickly. Favour. After a moment, the door opens and you step inside. However, when your eyes adjust to the light, you see that Antoine is nowhere to be found. Is this a date ambush? What is this? Why is there ye medieval sushi on the table? Hmm. Antoine slowly steps out from behind the door. Ha. Ah, I see that you came alone. Good. One can never be too careful. To get to the point quickly, I'm certain that some counter-revolutionary scoundrel has tried to poison me. Specifically, here's what happened. One night, I was taking coffee after dinner. This is normal for me, as I prefer to write in the evenings, and it helps me keep the vigour my work requires. However, after I took my first sip, I noticed a strange smell wafting from my cup. Um, how do you normally take your coffee? Oh-ho! Uh -huh. I prefer to take my coffee like Monsieur Talleyrand, black as the devil, hot as hell, and pure as an angel, sweet as love. It's a distinct flavour I cannot hesitate to recommend. Perfect for raising one's passions. This distinctive flavour is why I noticed that it smelled strange. Almost like garlic. Not long after my first deep sip, my throat began to burn. Yeah. Fearing the possibility of poison, I found a kitchen pot and forced myself to expel what I'd ingested. <sighs> as unreal as it may sound, I assure you that when I saw the contents of my stomach empty into pot, they were smoking like ashes of a fire. Afterward, I spent a whole day racked with feelings of unwellness. My heart felt like it was going to collapse in my chest. Faced with the approaching spectre of death, I struggled to think of what to do next. After all, it was very possible that I'd been betrayed by someone close to me. After a certain point, I realised you were the only person I could really trust. <sighs> Antoine sighs, genuinely shaken for a moment. What should we do next? Hmm. Stay out of the public eye. I'll find the assassin. The poison might still be inside you see a doctor. What would you suggest? Hmm. Well, I think I will find the assassin. Your revolutionary zeal speaks volumes, my dear. Only through action will justice be ours. I live alone here and I rarely host anyone for dinner, which all narrows the field of suspects significantly. The only person I could possibly suspect is the man I buy my coffee from, Monsieur Toiri. He's an older man who suffers from strange tremors, always at Les Halles, the market. Sorry, but I must take some time to lie down. This has all been extremely draining. You leave Antoine to his recovery and head home. It's already starting to get late. Solving attempted murders was not what I intended to do when I moved to Paris. <sighs> With a weary sigh, you continue your walk home, trying to drive the thoughts of assassins and caustic poisoning from your mind. Your efforts are only partly successful. Here. Yeah. Poor Antoine. I feel nothing, though. While getting ready for the day, you notice that Camille has left a letter on your nightstand. The wax seal shines red like fresh blood tripped over the line. You break the seal with a deft slice from your letter opener. You can immediately tell that the handwriting is Antoine's. He writes quickly enough that you can find small splatters of ink at the top of his compressed, precise letters. Cher Yvette. Uh, uh, I mean, Cher Yvette. Uh. I've, I've grown dissatisfied with the ceaseless inaction of my peers and I've decided to do something myself. I would like you to join me, should you find yourself inclined to the cause of liberty. The letter goes on to describe a location where you can meet him. Fear not, I'm certain you will enjoy this as much as the royalists will hate it. Antoine. You check his directions against your map. If you head out now, it might be possible to meet up with Antoine today. Well, does he want me to get his assassin, or does he want to go and do something else? Hello. Hello. Yesterday, 
With great fanfare, the Estates General finally convened. This great meeting is the result of His Majesty the King calling together all three Estates of France to debate and vote upon how the various crises ravaging the country shall be resolved. As part of the opening ceremony, each Estate paraded down the street of the city. The first estate, the church, sent clergymen from all over France. Among their member are everything from humble countryside priests in black cassocks to resplendent bishops and cardinals bedecked in crimson and gold. The second estate, the nobility, strutted down the streets in unison, bedecked in their finest clothes and jewels. They seemed like an army of swaggering peacocks. Theirs is the realm of tradition, privilege, and loyalty to the crown. The third estate, representing over nine-tenths of France's population, marched in stern and quiet rows, dressed in black, browns, and other sober colours. They represent everyone from the highest judge to the wealthiest factory owner, owner to the lowest peasant. In fact, His Majesty has even seen fit to break from tradition to grant the third estate double representation. Twice the amount of representatives, they're closer to representing their own stake in the country, which was originally a source of great hope. Unfortunately, it's come to pass that while they were granted double representation, they haven't been given double amount of votes. The third estate still can only cast as many votes as either the first or the second estate. Their double representation is purely symbolic politics, eh? Bloody system. Needless to say, this has made many people extremely unhappy. In fact, it's led to some within the third estate to... Wait. What the devil? Clenching the newspaper in your tightening clutches, you reread the article carefully. One of the men described in the article sounds extremely familiar. Long brown hair, young, tall, representing the nobility of the second estate, but is elected to merely wear a fine blue coat for the opening ceremonies without other adornments. The article writer singled out his casual attire as disrespectful. That's Armand. You're absolutely certain of it. Our fiancé, who's missing. Without any illustrations to speak of, you're forced to carefully reread the short passage over and over again. With every tiny statement about the reporter's chosen viewing point of the ceremonies gains a new value as you attempt to deduce where Armand was last seen. After checking your findings against your map of Paris, you think you may have a lead. Man, we've got so many things now. All right. Request the attendance of me to a military ball. Hmm. Well, I will go. Yes, I will. One party on my calendar. Camille. Okay. I probably need a new dress, don't I? These ones have really run through their novelty. But do I want to spend a day doing that? God, that was a lot of reading to get us in. So, hmm. Okay, we're going to have to choose here. We have... Let's see what you guys think. Number one, a revolution with Antoine. Get the revolution going. Number two, look into Antoine's poisoning. Number three, follow up the lead of Armand. Where is Armand, our fiancé? Which of those plot points... Would you rather we chase up straight away so we don't lose them? I don't know if they're timed or what, so. Mm -hmm. If you have a preference, we'll try and find some time to get a dress tomorrow, I think. So we have some time for a party. Armand! You guys really don't care about Antoine, do you? <sighs> I'm a walking red flag. Nobody cares. My date was terrible. I bet if my date was good, they'd care, but no. I fluffed the date, and now nobody has any emotions towards me one way or another. Getting ready in a flash, you head out onto the street with the newspaper and your journal, determined to find some evidence of where Armand could possibly be. The journalist who wrote the article mentioned a nearby bakery. It sounded familiar to you from your various walks about Paris. A boulangerie, if you will. Un croissant. Un pain de chocolat. You curse yourself for having to rely on such thin evidence. It's a description of a man who might be Armand, reported being seen near a bakery, which might be one that you vaguely remember. There's no guarantee he'll ever come back here. There's barely a guarantee he was even here at all. It's utterly maddening, and you struggle to remember what's even motivating you right now. Armand must rue the day he wronged me. I'll find him because I love him. 
Can that really be true? I'm gallivanting around dating everyone. Um, the truth. You feel a rush of energy as you say this to yourself. You cannot rest until you have answers. You manage to find the bakery, but you're uncertain as to where to start your search. Mm, go inside. You're about to step inside when you feel a tap on your shoulder. <gasps> Haramand. It's... We should get off the street, he says quietly. You're still struck dumb with shock when he leads you off the street and into a nearby tavern with no other patrons. The staff look at the two of you with a mixture of confusion and indignation, as if the very idea of customers offends them to their core. Even after sitting there for a few minutes, nobody approaches your table. This might ex help explain why there are no other customers in here. I'm so glad to see you, he says, his eyes staring deeply into your own. How? How dare you? How dare you even speak to me after all of this? I understand your anger. Anger. And also eggs. Ma cherie, I really do. But can you at least give me a chance to explain myself? Oh. I didn't mean to upset you. Don't lose faith. Why are you losing favor with me? I'm the one that's outraged. You should be nice to me. I came to Paris, and as you can tell by my old dwellings, I had to live very frugally. As much as I enjoy little luxuries, my money was better spent on my other pursuits in the city. I was attending parties and needed to make inroads with powerful people, including one Viscountess de Foix. He shakes his head ruefully. I was beside myself with rage when I'd heard that they lashed out at you to get vengeance on me. I knew I'd angered them with my proposals, but I had no idea they'd sink to such wretched behavior. In fact, he says in a low voice, I believe they're the ones who sent those men to do violence upon me. Ooh. Thankfully, my father's constant insistence that I study the art of pugilism proved to be wise. After a great struggle and several smart applications of a candelabra to their heads and shoulders, I managed to drive them both from the, ha the house and their horses. <laughs> I'm so tired. He stands proudly. Houses and horses, Dr. Zeus. But a telltale wind suggests he might still be recovering from some injuries. However, I had no idea when those villains would return, and how many of their associates they'd bring with them. I had to flee that very night. I know in my mind that it was a sound decision, but in my heart I've regretted it ever since. I'm so sorry. <gasps> I've already forgiven you. Apologize all you wish. Words won't heal this. I have things of my own I need to apologize for. Ooh, let's both apologize. Oh. Please, ma chérie, don't think anything of it. You had no idea where I was or if I'd ever be back at all. As for our present, I would never ask you to rebuild a ship in the middle of a storm. Much in the same way, I'd rather we figure out what we're doing with ourselves when all this stops being such a hurricane. You are willing to wait for me. I'm willing to wait for you. Well, of course, right now, I still have to risk going to the Estates General, as I have many important things to do there. Thankfully, nobody can risk assailing me while I'm there. But I have to keep my living situation a secret due to the threat of ambush. He says while he pulls out a piece of paper and begins to write on it. He hands you the paper, which he's written his address on. It's a house on the western edge of the city. Don't worry, it's just as charming as the one you're living in at the moment. While I can't move back in with you, you'll at least be able to visit me when we're st where we're staying. So now he's going to be dateable if we want to, like, rekindle with our fiancé? Wow. What do you mean, where we're staying? Hmm. Ah, uh, yes. Well, you see... What? Armand, what the devil are you doing here? We need to... A woman asks as she walks into the tavern. Huh. Ah, a vet. We meet again. Uh -uh. You two already know each other, Armand asks. Oh. We've met once or twice, Armand. We need to hurry. If someone like her could find you, then we aren't doing a very good job of hiding. We have to go. Yeah. Just when I finally found her again? Absolutely not. The longer we stay on the streets, the more likely it is some assassin runs a blade through your ribs. Like she's not evil. Joanna replies in a soothing voice, resting her fingers on the back of his head. You won't see her again at all if that happens. I suppose that's reasonable, Armand admits, running his fingers through his hair. Yvette, you know how to find me. I want to tell you more, but for now, I need to go. Don't worry, this won't last forever. They leave. <sighs> the more I'm learning about this situation, the less I like it. You exit the tavern, your mind swirling with dark possibilities and heavy with a sense of dread. You found Armand, but now you're wondering if that was for the best. Bloody Joanna. 
she's up to no good, trying to steal my man. I'm about to throw some princess paws around here. Um, let's go get a dress today, because otherwise a party will be upon us and I'll... But I'll be not having a thing to wear. Hmm, new provincial dresses. And just humbles. They don't have anything... Fancy. Hmm. 12, 13. Bum, bum, bum. Who likes this? The church, the military, and the crown a little bit. We want revolution stuff. None of these are for the revolution. I do have a military event coming up. 78. Hmm. Bum, bum, bum. It's a very nice outfit. I honestly think it looks better in the yellow, but... And that's only 40. Do you want to buy that one? Does that take up my whole day? Oh my god, it does. Wow. My whole day? We did meet the priest, didn't we? Trying to steal your man as you woo to others. Listen, I thought he was dead. I moved on quickly, it's fine. He left me here. He catfished me. Left me in this stinky old house. Relax. Do you know what? I want to go and see what happens if we go to this garden. Like, it doesn't say what's going to happen, right? So I'm curious if we go here, if, like, some random story will unfold. Deciding to explore the fifth... Today, you stroll along the southern banks of the River Seine. Barges sail up and down the river, jockeying for position with the pleasure crafts of the wealthy and the occasional floating bathhouse. A merry patron of one such bathhouse waves to you from the comfort of his tub. Just as you cross the street, you spot a verdant clearing ahead of you. Looking around at the well-manicured greenery, you realize you've arrived at Jardin de Blanc. Garden of plants? It's beautiful and tranquil, a lush respite from the bustle and cacophony of the city. Looks lovely. Couples stroll the paths, arm in arm, furtive Furtive glances and nods of respect are exchanged between passing groups as people put forth their best efforts to see and be seen. Pulling out your journal, you jot down the location. Oh, so we can go on dates here now. Perfect place to go with someone who prefers down tempo entertainment and an eye for natural beauty. After lingering a few minutes further, you head home. Take the priest there. It actually means flower. Um, oh, a date with Alex. Yes. A date with Antoine. <laughs> sure, dude. Why not? That clown. That clown of a man. Okay. Let's follow up with Armand here. Go visit his house and steam up the windows and see what he's up to with that woman. It's a long walk to get to the Armand's address. The Armand's address on the western edge of Paris. But compared to the events of the last month or so, it's as easy as, as a stroll around the block. The neighborhood is a poor one, but filled with the kind of poor who still feel that they can improve their station. Persons strut proudly down the streets, wearing one or two articles of fine clothing over their worn-out ones, seeming almost a parody of wealthy aristocrats who glide about La Place Royale. To them, these one or two expensive things are both a luxury and valuable armour against the sneers and derision of those better off. Look at me, look at me sneakers! They're... I got me Yeezys, they're well expensive. You're wearing £5 Primark sweatpants, yeah, but look at me sneakers! Time and time again, you've seen that the poorer ones, it's the harder it is to gain someone's trust. In lives like theirs, any scraps of trust could be the difference between survival and complete destitution. 
Armand must have chosen this address because he wouldn't stand out here. In his fashion of a fine nobleman's jacket and plainer clothes underneath, he'd look like any other proud and desperate man, trying to strive for something better. You manage to find Armand's new home, three stories tall but thin and leaning to one side. It feels less like a home and more like an old man crippled with age. It reminds you of your own living situation. However, judging from the dust and the cracked window panes, he doesn't have anyone like Camille to take care of things. Well, Armand isn't the only one living there. There's also this Joanna woman. You're still uncertain of her role in all of this. Could she be the one who wrote that cryptic letter to him which you found secreted underneath the floorboards? You knock on the door and hear some movement inside before someone opens the door just a crack. Spotting you, Armand flings open the door and bounds outside. Oh, ma chérie, it's great to see you again. Please come in. You walk in. He takes your cloak from you to hang it on a coat rack. The inside of the building is remarkably sparse and without any decorations. It feels more like an outpost than a home. Please, make yourself at home. Joanna is out, so it's just you and me for the moment. Armand, I don't know how I feel about this, Joanna. Tell me more. <laughs> but of course, he replies happy, a little relieved. Because we still care, or what? My friend Charles, also known as Chiles, introduced me to her when I first moved to Paris. And while our organization here has been growing rapidly, I've essentially become her closest confidant. She'd never take credit for it. She's the real founder of this society I've become a part of. Hmm. She's the leader of the revolution? Is that what this is? He gestures to the walls, which are covered in maps and notes. She's clever, tenacious. She speaks French so well for someone who didn't grow up with the language. You'd think back on your brief conversation with her and never even detected a hint of a foreign accent. Why would she put so much effort into sounding exactly like a native French speaker? Glad to see you reacting this way, Armand admits. I was afraid you'd be jealous of her. I am. After all, if the gossip is true, you've been recently entangled with Louis Antoine. <laughs> what? What? What do you mean the gossip? Who's gossiping? Who told you that, Armand? He reads your facial expression and holds up his hands innocently. Don't take me for a jealous bore of it. As I may have said before, I don't blame you given the circumstances. Listen! He thought someone had poisoned him. I just went around to help, actually. It's Alex you need to worry about. Is that what? I'm more curious than anything, because I've never met him. What's he really like? Why does the game think I want to be with Antoine? Um... He's merely a fun diversion for me. I can't do him like that. Look, he's like you say, a fiery man who demands dedication from those around him. Oh really? Perhaps I'll have to learn a little more about him myself. Oh yes, I have something to show you, he says, leading you up two creaky flights of stairs to a window. It immediately feels different from the other ones in the house, because you can see that the glass here has actually been cleaned and polished. Look out at all that, he says, gesturing to the city. You're at the very top of a small hill, and all the buildings in the neighborhood are short lending you a remarkably clear view of Paris. I come here to think every day, to think about the responsibility I have to those people. While I'll never see them all, I can see their houses, their workplaces, and all the other places that serve as stages for their lives. Few of them will ever have the power to change things, sometimes by mere circumstances of their birth. Still, that only makes it even more important that I do something right. He's like, oh, you think Antoine cares? Come up and stand by this window for me as I pine about my place in the world. That's why I joined this group, the Frankish Habsburgian Society. In Austria, the House of Habsburg has managed reforms for more efficient governance, religious tolerance, land reforms, and more. Here in France, we have a battle brewing between two disastrous powers. First, the aristocracy, who would march our country off a cliff if it allowed them to preserve their privileges for another day. And the revolutionaries, who can only agree on what they wish to tear down, but not on what they'll build afterwards. Her Majesty our Queen was born Maria Antonia Joseph Joanna, Josepha even, daughter of the Empress of Austria. Her brother Joseph II is the Holy Roman Emperor. If our two countries were brought together under a single rule, France would have the resources to solve its immediate crisis, and the political will necessary to do away with our more back situation. So wait, she's like an Austrian spy that is trying to overthrow French government and take it over for the Holy Roman Emperor? Every single day I look out this window and I think of all the people we could save. Oh, that's what it sounds like to me. Like, this isn't the revolution. This is Austrian espion espionage. Right? Um, I'll play along for now. 
It's amazing. Perfect. Well, it's certainly amazing, but it's far from perfect. What we're aiming to do is perilous. He takes his hand in yours. Yet, there's nobody I'd rather have at my side to fight for this future with than you. Give me all of the favour. Armand stares silently out the window, looking out at Paris and its people. You stare with him. Without a word, he grabs you by the waist and pulls you closer. You rest your head in the crook of his shoulder and realise that you'd nearly forgotten how it felt. Hmm. The two of you watch the sun set on the city together. The lights of city. The lights of city slowly appear like a second set of stars. Quietly, he says, I have to leave for a meeting tonight. More secrets and skullduggery. We have something coming up that will involve convincing a lot of people to our cause. I think you'd be perfect for it. I'll have someone leave a message with Camille when we get close to the date. You can stay here for a little while longer if you like. Can I trust you to let yourself out? No, I'm going to steal everything you own while you're gone. <laughs> oh, villainous woman, please have mercy. I'm but a poor baron who has fallen on hard times. The two of you spend the next few minutes giggling as you chase each other around the house. <laughs> chase me. You keep trying to steal various books and silverware, and he keeps trying to put the purloined items back in their proper place. Eventually, he catches you trying to walk away with his broken grandfather clock, and you both collapse in fits of laughter. Armand is just about to leave before he turns back to you and says, I just wanted to say I never stopped thinking about you. In fact, I still have all the letters you wrote me locked away in my desk, as you should. With a gentle smile, he departs for his meeting, leaving you alone in his house. What well, do you want? A medal? I kept your love letters. Of course you did. You're supposed to get married, you absolute plum. You relax and assess your situation for a while before leaving yourself. Alone, you walk down the nighttime streets by yourself, considering all you've just learned. Fantastique. I've managed to find my fiancé, and now I'm an accomplice to treason. Your head hangs heavy as if a millstone has been placed around your neck. As you trudge home, you spend the long walk through the dark, wondering how exactly you'll manage to rescue yourself from this latest set of dangers. <laughs> so wait, don't tell me it's a choice between Armand and the Austrians, and then if I want to do the revolution, I have to get with Antoine. Please. You look up at the sound of Camille knocking on your door frame. Good morning, madame. Huh. The house is rented due today. Uh -huh. right, on your way. Take it and go. Okay. Oakley. Oh, Jesus Christ. Sorry, that was my phone. Mm -mm -mm. Um. Where to? Mm -mm -mm. My bar must be low. It's working on me. Armand is? Armand? Or Antoine? So we have Antoine's poison, or what was the other thing? Antoine's invited you to join him in some direct political action. Oh yeah, or do revolutionary stuff. Maybe we'll do the revolutionary stuff. I am curious to see who's poisoned him. I've got like a weird feeling maybe it was Alex. Because there was that little scene with them kind of fighting over me, wasn't there? Could be. Is it all about me? Is it me? Am I the drama? Oh, Armand's is. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, chasing around, like, the house bit was really cute. Not so sure about him living with an Austrian spy, though. Let's see what these are, if they're just rumours or if there's any special event on them. <gasps> Honorade. We haven't seen her in so long. We have to go see her. Out in the city, you find yourself wandering a street lined with businesses, making and selling fine furniture. The air smells of rich wood, sweet resins, and pungent varnishes. Just looking at all the magnificent pieces on display is enough to make you wonder how much it would cost to replace the aging and splintering furnishings in your own home. Probably far too much. It's then that you spot a familiar figure wearing a dress as dark as midnight, examining a store with a worn and illegible sign. Madame Gazelle doesn't seem to notice you as she enters the shop. Oh, let's spy on her. Follow her inside. You follow Honorado inside the shop, slipping in just before the door closes. Inside, you recognize the establishment as another workshop specializing in fine furniture. The floor is littered with wood chips, but the products themselves look magnificent. Peril. 
Honorade gently flags down the proprietor. Monsieur, is this Boulet's furnishings? Huh? What? Speak up, madam, he replies, holding a hand to his ear. Or actually, he should be like, Oh, what? I'm old. I just can't hear so well. It's that one, isn't it? All this time around, hammering and saws must have taken its toll. Oh, it's not age. He's deaf. I said, is this store Boulet's furnishings? I've been told you make bespoke furniture. What? Yes, this is Boulet's. We do custom work. He replies happily and a little too loudly. Magnifique. I've been told you specialize in craftsmanship and discretion. Madame Gazelle says as she leans in and unrolls a large piece of parchment in front of him. What do you think it would cost to make something like this? <sighs> Monsieur Boulet closely examines the paper, reorients it, and stares at it some more. His expression is grave. I'm thinking... Torture device? You look over his shoulder at the plans and immediately recognize Madame Gazelle's handwriting. The drawing itself, you don't recognize furniture like that at all. It's hard angles and strangely placed padding and steel rings. Madam, what exactly have you bought into my fine shop? Madam Gazelle is starting to look concerned. Are you not Caesar Boulet? Most oh, certainly not, madam. I'm his brother, Francois Boulet. Caesar was kicked out of this shop last year for his vile and perverse creations. I should report you to the archers for bringing this obscenity into my fine shop. Um. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Um. What should we do? Peril? Credibility check? Money? Credibility check. Effect, what are you doing here? Madame Gazelle asks, noticing you for the first time. Yeah. That's utterly preposterous! Monsieur Bouly snaps at you, slapping Madame Gazelle's plans with the back of his hand. It's a bizarre design, to be sure, but there's nothing difficult about it. It's just a peg and a dowel construction with some fine upholstery on the... Oh. He pauses to re-examine the paper. No, that's not right. If this was to be load-bearing, it would have to... Ugh, fine. Madam, I shall create this wicked thing for you, but merely as an exercise of my craft. Ah. Monsieur, I would expect nothing less from a man of your abilities. She smiles and slips him a business card. Please send someone by when it's complete. Before you can say anything else, Madame Gazelle takes you by the hand and leads you outside. Filth! You hear from inside. <laughs> what a filth this thing is. Interesting, though. And then silence. Yvette, I want to make it absolutely clear. I don't appreciate being followed. She growls at you. Mm -hmm. Yet I do find it hard to argue with the quality of your results. Of course, I must ask you to forget what you saw. She continues with a breezy laugh. After all, I'd hate to ruin any potential surprises. Without another word, Madame Gazelle walks away, leaving you to puzzle over what just happened. You're building that thing for me? What the hell? Uh, Duchess. A party for the bourgeoisie. Sure. I'm going to try to, like, say no to some parties this time because we exhausted ourselves last time. But it already seems like we have quite a bit of uh, free time. Yeah, that was, like, so totally, um, what would the word be, like, signaled when we, were get, when we first met her and we were getting out of her coach and she's like, call me Madame Gazelle rather than Honorade. Is that all right with you? Mm. Like, yes, mistress. <laughs> shim, shim, shim. Um, all right, what do we have? Some gossip. I think we're okay for money at the moment. Let's do one of these Antoine ones. Let's do oh, poison or revolution. I guess we're going to get to do them both. Let's do... Revolution first. To see this side of Antoine. The nighttime sky is overcast. The streets smell of freshly finished rain. You use one hand to adjust your hood while you look down at the directions that Antoine provided in his letter. You glance around at the buildings and note you found yourself in one of the nicer neighborhoods in Paris. In fact, you're not from La Place Royale. You're not from or far from? 
feel like the typos are getting a bit more frequent. You've reached the end of your direction, so you must be in the right place, however there's nothing that seems particularly special about this address. You glance around and find the streets to be empty. There's no sign of Antoine at all. Suddenly you feel a hand reach across your body, grab you by the shoulder and pull you into an alley. Hey. When your eyes adjust to the light, you realize your assailant is none other than Antoine. He's pressed so close to you against the wall that you can feel his rapid heartbeat through his coat. Uh -huh. I see that you came. That's good. Little favor. Neither of you say anything for a long time. Instead, the two of you gaze upon each other in the dark, your lips hovering dangerously close. Listen, I didn't sign up for this just by coming here, okay, game? No. No, we do not feel this way. Suddenly, he pulls away, releasing you. Are you ready to do something very direct, very fun, and very illegal? Do you invite every girl that you fancy out to commit crimes against the crown? Ooh. No, but you don't feel like every girl to me. He replies, flashing you a wolfish smile in the dark. Oh god, it's going well. Antoine gestures behind himself to some buckets of paste and rolled up posters. I've managed to convince some sympathetic citizens to print up these posters that are rather objectionable to crown. Your curiosity peaked, you unroll one of them and examine it by the light of a guttering street lantern. The poster is a potent mixture of accurate political commentary and extremely obscene imagery. If we posted these in a poor neighbourhood, one sympathetic to our cause, the Watch wouldn't hesitate to punish the people who live there. So instead, we're taking our work directly to the heart of the problem. He gestures out of the alleyway to the wealthy neighbourhood around you. Of course, I'm sure the Watch will be sympathetic to the inhabitants of this neighbourhood once we cover it in our messages. It also means we get to make ourselves heard and remind them all of the discontent ruin in France. The powerful only sleep comfortably at night because they've convinced themselves that the order they hold by force is the result of public will. They lie to themselves and pretend that their edicts are supported by a silent majority of commoners instead of a regime of organised violence. He holds up a bucket and a paste brush. Let's challenge that notion, shall we? Paste posters directly onto people's windows. Wow. Um, do I really want the peril? It did warn us that peril is going to be way more important. I'm not going to get some for hanging out with Antoine. I'm going to just put a bunch up. Moving as quickly as you can, you start pasting as many posters as you can in as many obvious places as possible. Hmm. He gives you an upward nod of approval. That's the spirit. These should be visible to anyone who walks through here. As you and Antoine continue to paper the neighbourhood in posters, you feel giddy, almost childlike. There's something freeing about exerting your will over this place. A place home to people who wield more power in a single day than you've had in your whole life. Every woman in the world looks better when she's defacing the possessions of the powerful. Eat the rich, says Antoine. But you especially. You shine brighter than any lantern in this city. Both of you freeze in place as you hear the sound of approaching footsteps. Those footsteps grow into the tramping of multiple sets of boots. The light of a lantern shines off a window far down the street. That must be the archers. We haven't been discovered yet. They're walking, not running. Still, they'll be here soon. We need to leave. Sure. He nods silently in agreement and quietly sets his rem remaining materials on the ground. Once you do the same, he grabs you by the hand and leads you away. In the distance, you hear the anger and disgust in Watchmen's voices as they eventually discover your handiwork. Their discontent grows louder and you can hear one of them shout, Find who did this! Find them now! The two of you duck down a narrow alley together. In the close confines of your hiding place, you find yourself pressed up against Antoine. Um... Sir? Focus on hiding or kiss him. I mean, we came to play, right? Seized by the moment, you kiss him. At first, he's surprised, but quickly falls to the same adrenaline fueled passion as yourself. You can feel his fingers wrap tightly around the hair on the back of your head. One of the archers is close, extremely close. You can smell the oil of his lantern, the stench of tobacco on his uniform. Antoine doesn't pull away from your embrace, but you can feel one of his hands moving around. In the darkness, you see the glint of steel as he draws a stiletto from his coat sleeve. Oh. You finally manage to exhale when the watchman gives up searching in your area to go investigate somewhere else. Together, the two of you make your escape. 
Antoine offers to walk you home and you take him up on his offer. The two of you laugh and chat together, giddy from the adrenaline rush of what just transpired. He walks you home and gives you a silent upward nod before he turns to leave. Heh? Camille is waiting on the doorstep. Welcome home, madame. How was your night out? Uh, softly in the background. Here comes the... Um, it was exciting. Oh, that boy is going to be the death of me, Camille. Let me tell you. You head upstairs to your room, imagining all the different ways that tonight could have gone. Despite how tired you are, you find it difficult to get to sleep. I was caught up in the moment, okay, Antoine? I don't know. I will say, kissing someone whilst being searched for, and then they're like, hold, they're like taking a knife out to like being ready to protect from the police, like, but not giving up on the kiss. That was pretty, that was pretty fire, you know? You wake up to find a letter waiting for you on your bedside table. This wouldn't be unusual, save for the fact that it's sealed in plain uncolored wax, which hasn't been stamped with a sigil of any sort. Opening the letter, you immediately recognize Armand's handwriting. However, the writing style is remarkably brief for him. You find yourself instinctively checking for another three or four pages of text that don't exist. Share of it. Ioana recently finished setting up a meeting place where we can meet with notable individuals who are attending the Estate General. More importantly, these are persons who are interested in learning more about the goals of humble society. It sounds to you like some very influential people are genuinely intrigued by this Frankish Habsburgian society business. You read on a little further and find an address. Okay, your knowledge, canniness, and infamy would be an amazing asset to us. I would love to see you there. You put down the letter and check your calendar. You might be able to visit that place today. Wow. I feel like the first chapter was pretty slow burn and the chapter two is just everything is happening. We went to so many parties in the first chapter, and now it is everything. I wonder if what you do in the first chapter is setting up everything that happens here in terms of who you meet. Because now I only have a military party and a bourgeoisie party. I don't have anything with the church. Like, maybe I met that priest too late to have him as a love interest or something. I don't know. We'll see. Mm -mm. Like, I wonder how different it is every time. Let's see. Down by the water, an, an unusual man of many talents. A chance conversation may hold the power to subtly alter the future. Chapter 2, Hot Girl Summer. Exploring a more dangerous part of the city carries some risks. A bodyguard. I feel like I want to get that guy. A lovesick priest. Oh no! What are these choices? It's so hard, man. That's the poison one. That's Armand. I hope we get time to do all of these. These ones will stay, so we'll do a question mark one. Um. I feel like a bodyguard could be so useful. Here, like alter the future. That sounds really intriguing. Let's see what that is. You decide to spend the day walking alongside the river. Halfway through your walk, you notice the sun hitting the water just right, lending brilliant light to the colourful ships and boats. It's a chance moment that looks as beautiful as a painting. You pause to lean against a railing to take it all in. Do you guys have rivers where you are? I love walking by the river. God, I haven't done that for a while, but it's like, I don't know, it makes the walk so much more interesting. Nearby, you watch a small private ferry bump into a lavish pleasure craft, igniting a stream of insults and violent oaths from the pilots of the two crafts. Like, if you guys go for a walk, what do you walk by? Do you walk in a park? Woodland? Wildlife? Um, a river? A beach? Do you just walk through a city? What's your, what's your location? Start the hydration early. What's up, Girl Scout? How's it going? Living close to a river now, very close to your house. Rivers are nice. Woods and creeks, Mississippi. And my double S side, double S side, double P. -I. The river through downtown Chicago, Riverfront Park. Nice. A small lake. All lakes are nice. Walk around it and stuff, depending on how big it is. 
Just as the ferryman pulls his oar out of the water to hit someone, you notice you're not watching this scene alone. A man in black and white with a curious brooch on his jacket is watching the same scene as yourself. Beautiful music, isn't it? He asks quietly. Do you often sneak up on unsuspecting women? If I've surprised you, I assure you it was unintentional, he replies, his voice level and quiet. I simply didn't want to interrupt the proceedings going on before us. He gestures out to the river. One of the ship's pilots is trying to jump over to the other boat, but is in the process of being restrained by his own crewmates. As chaotic as it seems, even this everyday conflict has a familiar rhythm, order, and tempo. Just like music. Ah, yes. Ang Ang Angelos Angelos Strasner. Call me Angel at your service, madam, he says, gesturing to himself. Uh, a vet. Charmed to meet you as well, Madame de Kerr. We spoke of music earlier, and I just realized you may be able to help me. I have a decision that's left me feeling quite divided. I recently finished a new composition, and I'm looking for a sponsor who could help me fund the first performance of it. But I don't know which to pursue. As of right now, the two groups with the most influence in the world of music are the church and the bourgeoisie. I'm certain my composition will bring popularity to whomever sponsors it, but I don't know who would be best for me. I... Let's back the bourgeoisie, not the church. Quite a good point. He nods along, coming around to your idea. I'll start reaching out to my associates in the bourgeoisie, post-haste. Church is always going to have, like, royals back and stuff. That's going to be control, always. We're for the revolution. Maybe we can maybe we can convince the rich people to back it, you know? You look out upon the river and it seems that the conflict between the two boatsmen has been resolved without anyone being sent to the bottom of the river. Experimentally, you close your eyes and just listen to the noises of the city. Perhaps you're imagining things, but it does almost sound musical. The tenth. Ooh! party day we'll see Alex so let's wear our new military plus uniform credibility up Ooh, our credibility is looking good grab that early gossip let's not buy them wine Pum pum pum, pum 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 pum. What do we have? Gossip. Big gossip. We could use the money. Mm, mm, mm. And corporal aubergine. Let's do this one. Four turns here. You approach a woman who's been eyeing the other guests in a particular familiar way. In fact, it's the exact same way you look at guests at these functions. She looks up at you. Yvette de Coe, I take it, she asks, sipping on a glass of white wine. How do you know my name? Huh. Forgive me, but I'd be an awful gossip monger if I didn't. You're quite the popular subject of conversation, after all. My name is Anne de Croissant. We're both acquainted with Pierre Ronaldo. Funny little man, isn't he? I used to work for him as a rumour monger, a long time ago before his boss passed away and bequeathed him the newspaper. However, I've heard that he's gone so far as to promote you to being his journalist. Either that was very difficult or he's getting desperate. How's Pierre doing, by the way? Does he still gamble like a madman? Why did you stop working with Pierre? Hmm. Well, when the Crown finally put a halt to a royal censorship, newspapers started cropping up everywhere. Suddenly it became clear that Pierre was only a big fish because he'd been swimming in a little pond. For all his failings, Pierre has his principles and I admire that. However, you've seen his operation. The man's barely holding it together and I couldn't trust my living on something like that. By the way, I'm not certain what you're doing here tonight, but I'm here to interview the Comte de Blangerie. I mean, he doesn't know it's an interview, but that's not important. Simply put, I'm here to find something interesting related to the military. Can I trust you to stay out of my way? How about we interview him together and we'll cover every angle? Huh. Together? <laughs> It'd be agreeable to such a plan if we both sold the story to our respective employers at the same time. They'd be none the wiser. She leads you over to the... and engages him in a conversation. It looks like they've met before, but he has no idea what her actual profession is. 
It's like going on holiday and you can't read words like this without having to change your accent. Over to the Comte de Balloon Villiers. The two of you alternate in your conversation with him, slowly drawing out details of the latest scandals. Like a good gentleman, he attempts to remain discreet, but against the two of you, he doesn't stand a chance against two-pronged ambush of your charms. Shocking military gossip. The three of you stick together, chatting for a while. Okay. So this party, for people who missed previous, is like a sequence of getting gossip that you can sell for money or influence, and little bits of story as well. <gasps> a memory. A flashback. You step away from the crowds at the party to take a moment to be alone. A memory you had not considered for a while flashes through your mind. You're back in your provincial hometown. It was after Armand had left for the Estates General, but you yourself had yet to leave for Paris. Instead, you walked around in the cold, reading his letter over and over again. This particular one had been puzzling you for a while. In retrospect, his letters had been growing stranger for quite some time. But it's much easier to notice such warning signs long after the point where they would have been useful. Dwelling on such failures has never helped anyone. Warning signs like that gentleman named Charles who had accosted the two of you during your last night with Armand. Cherevet, my heart aches to see you with an ever-growing ardor that I'm scarcely able to control. I may be surrounded by companions here, but without you I feel alone. Whenever I find myself engaging with persons other than my sponsors, I find myself exasperated. So many powerful people calmly discussing the state of the nation as if it were a tennis match. As though there are only two possible victors, yet the outcome had no real meaning. Individuals like that cannot be allowed to steer the fate of our people. If we are presented with two bad options, we must force a third. To put it simply, it feels like France is a ship that is hurtling towards a rocky shore, and nobody is at the wheel. This awareness of imminent catastrophe is the main unifying thread that binds our little group together. Our leader is the only one who isn't worried. She works feverishly, but betrays no signs of fear. I think you would like her immensely. You two share a lot in common. Our leader. You had puzzled over this before. Who was this woman that Armand was referencing in his letter? Was this perhaps that Ioana person? Of course, in the name of building coalitions, I've had to partake in the company of several extremely unpleasant individuals. Perhaps the only reason I'm glad you're not here is I would hate to inflict their judgmental presence upon you. Even when I finally travel home from the interminable dinners of their grand estates, I feel like I'm being watched. I know I've said it before, but I really wish you were here. I know there are things I'm not seeing. Things that you would notice instantly. All I can be certain of is we're racing against an unseen clock. To put it simply, the people of France are hungry. And hungry people do not remain hungry for long. Je t'en bon. Armand. I trust Armand. I trust that something good can come of this. The more I think about it, the worse it gets. I'm in a den of vipers. I am in a den of vipers. With this dour assessment, you decide to engage with the world around you once more. The memory drifts away like waning moments of a dream. Hopefully you can still accomplish something at this party before the night is over. Where's Alex, I say? Is this girl still pretending to be me? Maybe I get another chance here at getting my money out of her. Ever since your last encounter, you've been looking for her, the woman who has been imitating you. Sneak up on her. So it's the, it's the same dialogue that we had before, but I messed up the ending. So I guess I can repeat this and choose the other option this time. It's a little too late to say that we have the wrong woman. So we only have to take one. Although, my credibility is pretty high today. Maybe with this credibility, I would be able to get both things from her. Mm, I'm going to try it. I'm curious. We're like 54, surely. Huh. You really want all that? I suppose this couldn't last forever. C'est vie. She pulls a sizable coin purse from her waist pockets and hands it to you, and proceeds to explain a rumour that could be valuable indeed. Oh, there we go, it worked. 
73. And some rumors. I guess I should be on my way then. She leaves. You're quite a bit richer for it. There's also the true benefit, which is that she's no longer sneaking about Paris and sullying your good name. With her gone, you look around the party. Cool. Why is Alex not here? Our military party entirely without Alex. What a bore. What a bore, darling. Well, let's, uh... Just grab some gossip from someone then. Uh... Give me the goss. Get out of my sight. Ah, ah. I guess because we have a date. Mm, a church party, you say? I'm going to say no. Keep some of my days open. It's time for a rendezvous with the man himself. Totally show up and be like, went to a military party yesterday. Didn't see you there. What were you doing? So, uh, military people don't care about what you're wearing, but I'll wear my new one again just because these ones are getting really low on novelty. I want to wear them out. You feel the exhaustion set in as soon as you step out the door. When they got one exhaustion, You return to the idyllic Gingwit Paradise, which is already packed with enthusiastic patrons, clapping in time with the band's music, drinking great gulps of wine and dancing. Great to see you, he says, not even taking it. Oh wait, hang on, what did this guy sound like? <coughs> ah, great to see you. Wasn't he like this? Great to see you, he says, not even taking a second glance at your clothes. You are once again reminded military men seem to have little interest in fashion. There you go. Ah, free-flowing drink, raucous fun, excellent dancing. This is going to be a great day. I hope this isn't the same date again. The two of you don't even get a table. Alex orders a bottle of wine for each of you, and you both spend the entire day dancing together. Okay, like, this date's amazing, but why is it the same? By the end of the evening, your legs hurt from dancing, your throat hurts from singing, and it doesn't matter. You're both too happy to care. What? It's the same? There aren't... No. Why isn't there other dates? There has to be. I thought that was the point of us unlocking those other locations. Was for us to pick where to go. Weird. Um, this is for the crown. Now. Hmm. Let's see. This isn't a date with Antoine. Is this going to be the same? Wear something for the revolution. I'll wear my... That one. Mm -hmm. You return. It's the stage performance again. Hey, you look ravishing. Yeah, we go to the theatre together. Walks us home. Now that you think about it, you've noticed Antoine rarely drinks at all. Something's bothering him and his normal fiery responses are few and far between. A few minutes later, the conversation reaches a long silent lull. Antoine, something's bothering you. You'll feel better if you say it now. He starts as if he didn't realise that you were talking to him. I drifted off, didn't I? This morning I started thinking about the past and I think my mind's been going in circles ever since. So maybe because we've done stuff with him since, we're getting a lot... Like, this is new. The beginning was the same. This is new. Maybe you have to unlock it. Back in Blerincourt, I was seeing someone else. Her name was Therese. We were 19 and in love. Her father was the most powerful man in town and didn't approve of her daughter seeing a young playwright with a penchant for causing trouble. Still, we were inseparable. After a little while, I proposed to her and she went to ask her father for permission. She was so excited. So excited, he says again, taking a swig from a small bottle of liquor he's been nursing throughout the night. You realise he's not over his ex. And you put an end to everything. 
Goodbye, Antoine. But when will I see you again? There was some family business that needed to be taken care of, so I was abroad for a little while. Every day I dreamed of coming home. I ran through every scenario in my head. I thought of marrying Therese right away. I thought of how I'd have to convince her father to let her follow her heart. I thought of us having to steal away together in the middle of the night. When I came home, I was greeted by something else entirely. By the time I got back, Therese was already married to someone else. What? Emmanuel Thorin. Emmanuel was from an important family in town. Therese's father didn't just overrule her wishes, he used her like a bargaining chip. Nobody bothered to step in on her behalf. Not even my own family, he growls through his teeth. How did Therese feel? When I went to see her, she was distant and evasive. I think she felt too guilty to even speak to me properly. Of course, I never blamed her. I know how much it must have hurt, which only made my anger worse. <laughs> he pauses for a while, searching his memories. It's funny. You're the first person I've told this story to. Who cares about how she felt? Of course it was. I was incensed with rage. I did what any full-blooded man in my situation would do. I stole my family's silver. A pair of pistols and I rode for Paris. It was a good life for a few days before I was arrested. The kind of freedom that I needed to clear my head. To align my principles. While I was locked in a reformatory, I had a lot of time to think about what exactly made me so angry. It wasn't just my romances being foiled or someone I loved being hurt. It was the thought that this was happening all over France. That it's still happening every single day. Why are we so content to dine on the table scraps of powerful, selfish men? Why are we so content to let them carve up our lives? After taking a moment to regain his calm, Antoine turns to you and says, Did you know some of our fellow revolutionaries heard about our direct action with the posters? and called it inspiring. In fact, those same people have placed me in charge of secretly reaching out to some of the other causes in city to build alliances on behalf of t revolution. Of course, while I understand the value of forming alliances, I also find the whole affair distasteful. I can't bring myself to begin the kinds of intrigues that have turned the king's courts into festering pits of petty schemes. <sighs> what do you think? Who should we reach out to? The military... That's, that's form an alliance with the military because there are other... Or the bourgeoisie because of uh, Honorade. Mmm. Difficult. Let's go with the bourgeoisie, I think. He looks at you, asconce. Asconce? I don't know if I've heard that word before. Yeah, the bourgeoisie. You really think I should reach out to those money-hungry pegs? He rubs his chin thoughtfully. Perhaps you're right. In the end, they're common people, just like us. Their clout would be useful. Move the bourgeoisie towards the revolution. We need to bring Honorade with us. Like, if we lose Alex, it's okay. You talk for a little bit longer until the two of you arrive at your house and Camille is waiting. Oh, who's this? Monsieur, I am Camille, Madame de Cour's maid of all works. Of course, that name does... does really make... No, that's still you speaking. Of course the name doesn't really make much sense. I clean, cook clean, get groceries and kill vermin, but there's lots of stuff I don't do. I've never done any carpentry or locksmithing. Camille trails off as she starts to list more and more jobs that she hasn't done. What do you think of her as your servant? Antoine whispers. She's wonderful. Glad to hear it. I always like to know that someone appreciates the people that do so much for them. I've never blown glass, I've never laid bricks, I've never made a boat. Camille continues to list off tasks that she's never done in your service. Bonne nuit, mademoiselle. Antoine says with an upwards nod. He seems nice. You know what, Camille, I think he is in his own way. You head upstairs to your room, your mind swirling with the night's revelations and wonder if Antoine could have been different or if he was always fated to become the man he is today. Tossing and turning in bed, it takes a long time to get to sleep. Interesting. So Antoine's whole deal with the revolution is the fact that it was over love and the rich kind of getting in the way of his romance. He 
wants to take down rich men. Kind of made me like him a bit more. So another date pops up and it's at the same place again. Let's see. I guess if we keep doing it, maybe we keep unlocking stuff. And Alex at the same place again. Maybe he'll do something different this time. Hmm. Um, let's see who poisoned. Oh, actually, we need a rest day. We're quite exhausted, so we'll rest. Yes, yes. Are you guys warming to Anton after these last, like, we've had quite a lot of Anton today. Or nah. Yeah or nah. Camille knocks on the door frame for rent. There we go. Da, 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 da. He's growing on you like a mushroom. But speaking of Antoine, let's find out who poisoned him. That morning, he set off towards Les Halls in the city's first... Oh, it's easy to find, as all you have to do is walk towards the massive rotunda. Your mission for the day is to find the villainous coffee merchant who possibly poisoned Antoine. We'll pretend it said because I accidentally clicked. You arrive at the market, find the entire place to be equal parts cramped, crowded, and thriving. Which makes sense for the largest fresh food market in the entire city. Even with France's dwindling supplies of grain and the rising costs of basic necessities, Les Halls is filled with people bidding ever higher for their daily sustenance. At the end of the day, nobody can walk away from the need to eat. An empty purse is an empty belly, and an empty belly is death. The size of the market itself works to your disadvantage, as your quarry is a single coffee merchant, and his only defining features are that he's a strange older man. He seems to suffer from tremors, perhaps from overindulgence in his own product. How can you locate such a man here? Simply ask for a coffee merchant, inquire about an older coffee merchant, Say I'm searching for a man I suspect of poisoning someone. Um, should we be that specific? Let's go with this one first. You quickly realize your line of inquiry was overly broad. It yields far too many results. Man, how many people are selling coffee here? You find yourself wasting quite a bit of time when an enthusiastic young coffee salesman is desperately trying to sell you what he claims to be the finest beans in the city. It takes some time, but that line of questioning begins to prove fruitful. You find yourself bouncing from place to place as you chase down your quarry. Apparently his market stall changes position with an unusual frequency. When you finally reach a distant corner of the market, you catch the pungent scent of high-quality coffee. When you spy the lone man operating the stall, you feel rather certain you're in the right place. Uh -huh. Care for some fresh invigorating coffee, madam? It's fresh off the ships of St. Dominique. From the finest mountain plantations in all the world. A man at the stall asks you. His clothes are expensive but almost worn out and his fingers twitch like a spider in its final moments. With a trembling metal spoon, he offers you a single coffee bean. <laughs> what an image. You cautiously accept it. Here we go. Choo-choo. Try the bean. You make a show of taking in the scent like a true connoisseur, but really you're checking for the smell of garlic. Feeling safe, you pop the bean into your mouth and chew. The bean itself is bitter, but not overpowering. Is that how you taste a coffee bean? You like chew it. The taste is warm with hints of lightly burnt caramel. Mmm, delish. Uh, what, what is that that I can assist you with? Mm. Your product is good. It's your other line of work that draws interest. Or ask him how he keeps the vermin from devouring it all. Like, maybe he... Accidentally put rat poison in it. Oh, what should we do? That's like making an assumption. This one, he could be like, "What? I don't know what you mean." You know? Maybe it was an accident. I feel like I'm drawn to this one. His expressive face suddenly seizes into a mask of stony neutrality. Where the work? The tension in him becomes palpable as he stares you down. Madam, I have no idea what you're 
talking about? Slowly he starts to pack up his market stall. These are neither the words nor the manner of an innocent man. Of that you can be sure. Madam, what are you really seeking here? I'm a connoisseur of your work. This is a warning. I know what you are. Confess now. <sighs> Medium credibility. My credibility's gone down to 34. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Could put some peril up. Confess now. Increase peril a medium amount or do a credibility check. Let's try a credibility check. We need to learn how these work. So medium credibility. We have 34. Is that enough? Of my work, he says, failing to conceal his surprise. He flinches away from you and begins to pack up his stool even faster. Don't try those honeyed words with me. You have no idea who you're talking to. You have no idea who I used to be. Damn it. Keeping an eye on you, he quickly and hastily finishes packing. With a fast but tremulous step, he finishes and leaves. Damn, dude. This game's so savage when you get something wrong. And I lost favor with Antoine. That's so annoying. I It needs more information on the credibility checks. They're really frustrating because I have no idea. There's like, a dice should come up and be like, failed. Just to give me, like, an idea. It's very frustrating. Every representative from every estate originally arrived with a long list of complaints collected from the people in their respective ball. However, they were able to pursue these complaints is entirely up to them. This has led to a stark difference between the rhetoric of the nobility in the second estate and that of the representatives of the commoners in the third estate. While the second estate preaches civility, unity, and staying the course, the third estate brings only reports of grievances and discord. This was further reinforced when representatives from the third estate recently set up to read aloud the reports of these people surrounding the Gabel, a deeply unpopular tax on salt enforced by oftentimes violent collectors. He spoke of these salt tax collectors as bloodsuckers of the nation who quaff the tears of the unfortunate from their goblets of gold. Unfortunately for him, this particular flowery outburst was dismissed as emotional rambling regardless of the facts of the grievance. His words have only been greeted with mockery by the press. This has been hard for both the revolutionaries trying to help the common man and the wealthy merchants of the bourgeoisie, who have also been deeply affected by these taxes. The revolution and the bourgeoisie have lost power. Oof. Well, well then. Revolution party, sure. La revolution. A rendezvous with Antoine. So let's see. <laughs> You look ravishing. He looks around. Same, same, same. You feel like today went quite well, and that's it. It's the same day every time. Hmm. Um. Military party. Shh. Nah. Why do I feel like that's a bug or something? That seems weird. All right, back to Armand's main story, yes? Actually, let me check these real quick. We have the bodyguard. I feel like that's going to be really important to get at some point before the end. Um, a dance together. Exploring the streets of Paris, you run into your newly rediscovered fiancé, and he suggests the two of you take a break from normal routine to enjoy life in Paris. I think we'll do that one. You wander the streets of Paris. As always, you're looking for an opportunity of some sort, but a certain malaise drags at your every step. It's not exhaustion per se, but it certainly makes things more difficult. Perhaps this is common in a life such as yours, where it's difficult to truly separate one's labor from their leisure. Oh, tell me about it. As you ponder this quandary, you feel a gentle tap on your shoulder. Turning around, you find yourself face to face with none other than your fiance, Armand. Yvette. I managed to finish my business early today. We so rarely get to see each other. How would you feel about joining me for a little merriment? Unable to think of any particular reason to object, you follow him to the eastern edge of Paris, to a certain Guinguette Paradis. The workday is far from over, yet somehow they seem to already have a good crowd. It's a merry place indeed, if a bit brash and rustic. Perhaps it would make a good place to take someone on a rendezvous. 
someone who enjoyed more lively and honest entertainment. Hmm. I have to admit, I've grown quite fond of this place. Do you come here a lot? Hmm. Back when I lived on this side of town, I frequented this idyllic Bacchanalia quite a bit. In fact, I even convinced Camille to join me at one point. It turns out, by the way, that Camille has no capacity for liquor. I'm not joking. After her first glass of wine, she started to try to clean the tables. After her second, she passed out. I had to carry her home myself. I think we should just run away with Camille. Armand grabs a table for the both of you and orders the house wine. It arrives in a clay pitcher and the vintage is completely unknown. Then again, this doesn't feel like a place where the patrons care about the specifics of their refreshments. Merely quantity and potency. A few glasses later, you notice the tempo of the music has started to pick up. He extends a hand to you across the table. Would you care to dance? A vigorous and passionate waltz. You take his hand and join him among the other dancers, choosing to dance a waltz together. Your movements together are synchronized and powerful. You feel his breathing as you dance so close together, you're almost cheek to cheek. The music isn't really suited for the dance, but that feels besides the point for a place like this. A waltz is more of an Austrian dance, but Armand seems remarkably familiar with it. Hmm. Dancing with Joanna, are we? Armand. You can feel the pressure of stares at your backs as you dance together. While times are changing, there are still those who view partnered dancing as indecent filth. Then again, they can take their complaints up with the hangman if they care so much. You and Armand have been defying convention for a long time. Why stop here? Right? That's a little hint that he's been dancing with her, right? Because she's Austrian. Now you and Armand are truly alone. You find a question coming to mind. Who was the man from the village or just enjoy the moment? Spill the beans, boy. Hmm. Charles, the bookseller. Years ago, once I'd devoured every book on political theory I could find, I started to order them from him. He lived in Avignon and had a much easier time obtaining the latest imprints. Eventually, my book started arriving with letters from him asking my opinion on this issue or that. And we stuck, struck up a frequent correspondence. You've been tongue dancing with Anton. It's even... Listen, that's for the revolution, guys. That's for the people. I didn't want to do that. That's for the people. Come on. It's for a power higher than myself. Goodness. Perhaps a year later, he asked if I'd be interested in joining a society of like-minded individuals who turned out to be the Frankish Habsburgian society. The rest is, as they say, history. The music winds down and you step away from the other dancers and revelers. Arm in arm, the two of you walk back through the city gates to Paris proper. This is where we must part ways, ma chérie. But I hope to see you again soon. Things may be chaotic now, but I just know we'll make it through this. Didn't even kiss me. What a loser. <sighs> I fell in love with Armand because he was a big fish in a small pond. I see that now. <laughs> what? Is that a compliment or a diss? It sounds like a diss. I have no solid feelings yet. It's a tempestuous world we live in. It does my heart well to see him again. How are you guys feeling about Armand? I don't know. I'm getting the I'm getting the hints of like him falling in love with this Joanna chick, honestly. But he is the noble the noble baron that brought us from our village to here. I will for now say it does my heart well. It truly was good to see him. After all, he's the reason you came to Paris in the first place. Still your first true love. Sometimes the first urges of the heart are those that are the most correct. I got some uh, some tea today. Some Pellegrino lemon tea. Which is nice to have again. Um, this is a military party. No. And do a lot less parties. Okay, tomorrow is a bourgeoisie party. Let's see what's on the map. Ah! It's been some time since Alex passed. It's never too late to pay one's respects. I'm sorry? 
is that what happened at the e the the little text at the end of the last chapter when I accidentally skipped through a couple? I missed Alex dying. Oh my god, dude. That's what we missed. That was they they didn't even give that a cutscene. They gave it the text at the end. Like how we get those political updates, which I thought were really boring. Oh my days, dude. He's dead. That's why he wasn't at the party. Didn't we just go on a part? Wait, didn't we just go on a date with him? Am I insane? We just went on a date with him and we're complaining that it was the same thing. Wait, wait, wait. Here, like a week ago. Mate, what is going on? Okay. Um, I think we should go visit his grave then. That's why it was the same. It was a memory. He's stuck there. Let's see what the heck that is. You leave your home to explore the streets of Paris. It takes a moment for you to realize you recognize the name of the graveyard from the newspaper where Alex was laid to rest after he was killed during the riots. How did we date him then? The article mentions something about him wanting to be buried near his father. Walking up and down the rows, he finds his grave and is shocked by the sight of it. You knew he was laid to rest here, but seeing the gravestone for yourself makes it feel real in a whole new way. You look upon the cold slab of stone and try to think of something to say. Why did you have to be a hero? Not knowing what else to say, you spend a while cursing the circumstances that led to this situation. It all feels pointless and unfair. Saying those words aloud grant you a vague sense of peace, like exhaling a breath you'd been holding for too long. It was good you came here. Burying such emotions might kill you faster than any of the other madness boiling inside this city. Perhaps Alex is watching over you now. He always was the protective sort. When you decide to head home, you're surprised by how late it's gotten. Weird. There's a screenshot in the trailer of him injured. We missed a whole chunk. It definitely didn't show any cutscene. I haven't even opened this since we last played it. That's weird. It felt like something wasn't right with that date. It was like, is this a bug? We've had three dates with him in... The well, that was the last one. We've had two dates with him in this chapter. We have a date with him tomorrow. What's going to happen? <laughs> We're meant to date him tomorrow. Okay. Well. All right. All right. This is a bourgeoisie party. So we'll wear this one. So confused. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. Gossip. Outrageous crown gossip. Mm, my credibility is pretty bad. I don't need any rumors. We should go sell our rumors, actually. <gasps> Honorade. Due to a flow of the party and the vagaries of guests wandering to and fro, you find yourself having a conversation alone with Madame Gazelle. Not that either of you mind, of course. <sighs> what irritates me so is that for all their complaints about the aristocracy, there are more than enough powerful members of the bourgeoisie who clearly just want to become the new nobility. They play at revolutionary talk and preach about fairness, but they're not really opposed to the order of the ancient regime. Merely who's running it. As if titles bought with money were more virtuous than ones bought with blood. She sighs and takes a sip of her water. Now I must admit that most aristocrats I've spoken to are tiresome bores that get some kind of carnal thrill from reminding you of their privileged station. I've met some wonderful counterexamples, but it feels like a case of exceptions that prove the rule. Regardless, I'm not even certain who I should be making entreaties to. All of Paris is picking sides, and it'd be nice to reach out to someone who we already have a good relationship with. Whoever she reaches out to will surely gain from her support, but she might react poorly to suggesting someone has a poor relationship with the bourgeoisie at the moment. Madame Gazelle swells her water thoughtfully. 
The revolution. The revolution, you say? Yes, you're absolutely right. The revolution and the bourgeoisie do seem to be getting along quite well at the moment, despite some of my more irritating peers' best efforts. Given the direction everything's heading, I should start positioning myself sooner rather than later. Some of my peers being insufferable isn't a reason to make a poor political decision. Revolution! He is the only one excited about this conversation. She looks apathetic. Seeing an opportunity, you decide to approach them. Though some might consider it a simple industry, there's a lot more complexity to wallpaper importing than one might imagine, he says before favouring Honorade with a sly wink. And where there's misunderstanding, there's profit. Wow, Madam Gazelle replies. That's absolutely fascinating. I'd never considered that before. She's lying. However, I'd hate to take up your time with too much, with all this talk about business. This is a social event after all. I'm sure you have a lot to attend to. He grins even wider and replies, Oh, don't worry, Madame Gazelle. My schedule's entirely open. In fact, I... Oh, Yvette, is that you? Madame Gazelle walks over and leads you into the conversation by the hand. I've never been so glad to see you before. Have you met Monsieur Harvard? Um... Oh, credibility check for saying we have an appointment and trying to save her from this guy. Yes, don't we have an appointment? He looks puzzled. <laughs> ah, yes, Madame Gazelle suddenly replies. How could I have been so forgetful? Yvette and I have some business we need to attend to. My apologies, monsieur. We must go. With that, she puts a hand on your waist meow, and leads you both away from the banker before he can formulate a proper objection. <laughs> Mon Dieu, you are a lifesaver, she whispers to you. If I had to tolerate that any longer, I would have gouged my own eyes out. The worst part of all this is that I actually do need advice on what I should be doing with Charles' fortune. I never took enough interest in the specifics of his work, and now I'm floundering. That's enough business talk. I'd rather discuss me and you. Oh, I couldn't possibly agree more, she says in a low voice, leaning close enough so that you can smell her perfume. It smells like violence. In fact, she says before giving a silent signal, her servant gives a signal and her servant Rene appears. He hands you a bone-colored business card with no name printed on it, merely an address. Write me a letter. I'd love to see you in a place where none of these pe people are able to interrupt us. That is, if you're amenable to such company. You can now go on a rendezvous with Madame Gazelle. Without another word, she leaves. The scent of her perfume hangs in the air, floral yet bitter. Well, this keeps getting better and better. You take the time to savor the scent, hanging in the air before tucking her business card into your bodice and returning to the rest of the party. Well, that was a party worth going to. Well, well, well. military party. Well, I mean, if Alex is dead, I'm not going to any more of those buddy parties. What's the point? What's the point, eh? Wasting my time. What's this? A rendezvous with Alex. So... <laughs> right. You're dead, sir. What are you doing here? <laughs> it's the same. Right. Back to the grave with you, you zombie. <sighs> What's this one? Uh, crown party. Uh, I'll go. I've been saying no to a lot. Honorade. Alex. Do you know what, Alex? It's time to move on, mate. I'm not your unfinished business. <laughs> Go on, son. Jog on. Date with Antoine. Oh, my God. We have one, two, three, four. No, one. No, we said no to that one. One, two, three. Okay, I thought I had blocked up this entire thing here. We were going to get absolutely exhausted. Okay. 
That's fine. Good thing I said no to those things. We should probably rest, though. Um, just see if anything's here. Antoine. Is that Antoine? A fiery revolutionary in the process of selling his latest and... Yeah, maybe this is a different way for you to meet them if you don't go to the parties. Uh, a coffee house. <gasps> Walking near the market, you come across your own maid who seems to be in a bit of trouble. Camille? Your ears perk up at the sound of a familiar voice, and you start slipping through the crowd in its direction. You stumble upon Camille, her arms full of, full with a basket full of the day's groceries. She's been stopped by a watchman of the Gwet Royal, one of the infamous archers. He's berating Camille in the middle of the street. How dare he? Uh, where'd you get these, he demands, gesturing to all her groceries. Quoi? But monsieur, you saw me buy these. I got them over there, she says, pointing in the direction of a market stall. I saw no such thing, he says, blistering at the suggestion that he could have been paying attention to his surroundings. Where's your receipt? Camille's eyes dart from side to side, and she turns her feet away from him. Something about this line of questioning is making her very uncomfortable. I I, I never get receipts, monsieur. What? That's, rid that's ridiculous. Why not? Says Camille, but it's totally him. Well, I don't... I can't... Camille starts and stops, looking ashamedly at the ground. You're going to have to give me a very good reason not to haul you away, he growls. One of his hands extends out low with his palm up. Hmm. I'm glad you found her. Accept this payment. A man has stolen my purse. Credibility check. I have none. Excuse me, monsieur. Don't you have better things to do than harass my servant? Raising yourself to your full height, you step between Camille and the watchman. You feel a slight tug as Camille starts holding onto the back of your skirts. Adorable. Yeah. I'm not harassing anyone, he spits at you, merely keeping an eye out for known criminals. I'm not a known criminal. I shop here every week, Camille yells out over your shoulder. The watchman's eyes twitch in anger. Noticing the crowd is finally starting to pay attention, the watchman simply glares at you. Fine, I'll trust you for now. However, I swear I'll be keeping an eye on you too. <laughs> wow, madam, that was amazing, she gushes. Normally, I remember to bribe the authorities, but something came over me and I completely forgot. You spend the rest of the day escorting Camille about on her daily errands. It takes a few minutes for her to completely feel comfortable again, but it comes eventually. Coyote. A worthy way to spend the day. Now we definitely need a rest, but I think... Okay, yes, we can rest today. Our exhaustion's pretty high. Spend the day at home. You're a thief. You're a bully. You're a liar. A crown event. No. A rendezvous. Well, I feel like I should just go wearing that. It is with Miss Gazelle, Madam Gazelle, so I will wear this one, which novelty is really wearing off, but... Dude, imagine wearing that to just go for a cup of coffee with someone. Jesus. The time, you know? It's a few hours before your rendezvous, and you're in your room starting to get ready. You hear knocking downstairs at the front door. Camille answers it, and you can hear an exchange, but the muttering is too soft for you to make out the specifics. Uh, madam? Madam Gazelle is here to see you. Don't worry, I'll delay her until you're ready. Before you can reply, Camille sets off with her new task with Gusto. But you're not optimistic about her success, based on what you hear of stammered attempts at an argument in the stairway. Some moments later, they enter together, with Camille trailing behind Madam Gazelle. Your hapless maid is carrying a large parcel with a bow on it. Madam, you have to understand, I tried to stop her. It's true. It was a very sweet attempt, Madam Gazelle admits, reassuring Camille with a light pat on the cheek. <laughs> Satisfied, she sets her focus on you. Bonsoir, Yvette. I've come bearing gifts. The parcel is placed in your hands and she continues. 
This morning, I realized we're almost the same size. I also know that you, ever the social butterfly, are always looking for novel outfits to wear at parties. You bought me a dress? I looked through my wardrobe and I found I had something which will look a lot better on you than it does on me. In fact, how would you feel about wearing it tonight? She's dressing me up. Um... Are you sure that's the only reason you're in my room while I'm still half naked? She barely conceals a smile. I'd considered it, but this is really more of an unexpected bounty than anything else. Go ahead, open it. You open the package and reveal gorgeous black silk dress. Expensive, rather revealing. It feels in line with the bourgeoisie. Honorade's outfit. Honorade pulls a pocket watch from her bow dice and notes the time before putting it away. It seems I've already taken too much of your time. If you want to make it to our rendezvous tonight, you'll need some help getting ready. Don't worry, madam. Camille happily interjects. There's something I... That will not be necessary. Your mistress and I shall attend to this ourselves. But... Without another word, Madame Gazelle firmly but politely ushers Camille out of the room. As I was saying, let's get you ready. This, of course, isn't the first time anyone has helped you get dressed before. However, those occasions were about comfort and efficiency. A ribbon tied here, a pin placed there. You were the one in control. This is different. Being pulled this way and that. Being fussily primped and preened without any consultation to you whatsoever. You're not the one in control here. All that seems to matter is whether your appearance pleases her. Oh, Madame Gazelle, I don't think I should be letting you do this while smiling. Stay silent, stay still, let her do as she pleases. <laughs> ah. Honorade continues her ministrations, but you can feel her slowing down. As you sit there, frozen in place, you wonder how one tells the difference between unwavering obedience and boredom. I should have done the second one! God damn it! <sighs> you look at yourself in the mirror, and you have to admit that Honorade has good taste. She spends some time adjusting your... Before you know it, these adjustments slowly turn into something firmer and more sensual. The moment you start to submit to her touch, she pulls away, leaving you wanting more. Shall we go, she asks innocently, as if it was all in your imagination. <clears throat> Do you always dress up girls in clothes before you romance them, or am I just special? I think we just say we. Uh -huh. I thought so. After all, everyone needs to see how good I've made you look. Exactly how I like you. Alright, we're back in. Favour up. I think she wanted us to protest with a smile. I think is what she was looking for there. I messed it up. But I'm... Odys. Together the two of you head outside, where Renee is awaiting you with Madame Gazelle's carriage. She holds the door open for you, and soon the two of you are whisked off to your destination. After spending the first half of the day getting ready, you head out for the rendezvous. Your first time visiting the fine dining room of La Grande Taverne de Londres. A few aristocrats glance up from their tables at you and take your measure before returning to their splendid food. Ever since you arrived together, Madame Gazelle has been standing- I want to see what this dress looks like. Has been standing far closer than the rules of politeness might allow. It's easy to forget how good she is at looming over people. <laughs> oh, this is very pleasing, she says, looking at you through narrowed eyes as she slowly circles you like a panther. You've done quite well. You gained a staggering amount of favor. Turning her attention from you, she surveys your location. <laughs> oh, I absolutely adore this place, Madame Gazelle says with a sigh. The food is exquisite. The lavish decor is excellent. And you know how much I love being served. Seems Madame Gazelle already knows the staff quite well. They have a solid rapport. She orders for you, but the food that they give you is quite exquisite. Why do I feel like this is going somewhere that's going to get me banned from stream? <laughs> like, I know all that's in my head is that I've seen her blueprint, and I'm just thinking, don't end up there. Please. At one point, the owner comes out to speak with both of you. He cuts a comical figure with his portly stature, twinkling eyes, and a sword on his hip. It seems he and Madame Gazelle know each other quite well. He has a special dessert brought to your table as a gift. The two of you split it, but she lets you have the lion's share. A few hours later, you realize it's getting late, and the two of you depart together. Looking at Madame Gazelle, you feel like today went quite well. The, like... 
the moment that you realise you don't really care about the political intrigue and revolution and partying in this game, and you're just like, let's just find a romance game to play. This is the good stuff. Yes. Yes, Madame Gazelle, whatever you say, Madame Gazelle. Um, a party for the revolution. I shall go. There we go. Thank you for the 100 biddies. Bodis. Was that what it said? It's funny because we've had a conversation about that word before because it was in one of the books that I read. Bodis. Bodice. Bodies nuts. Let's see. Oh, damn. That's the dress she gave us. Look at that. Plus 19 for the bourgeoisie. Minus 19 for the church. Church is like scandalous. What is that you have on? Very nice. Probably the best looking outfit so far. Although this is like huge. I look like a lampshade. Just like ripple that off, you know? Am I up on my tippy toes? One foot. Okay, who's this for? Revolution. Um, that one. I've really enjoyed this game, even though some of the bugs have been a bit... Well, what's happening? You know, but... It's good. That goss. Let the games begin. You love the dresses? If you guys had to go to a party, right? Like you were being forced for some reason. It was some inescapable event. And you knew you were going to have to dress like this era. So it was like big dresses that, you know, like pulled into a corset and all this kind of thing. And it's going to be hours putting a wig on. If you're a guy, it's like the suit and the everything's tight and boots and the hair and everything. Like, would you be like, oh, no, or would you be like, oh, yes, cool, definitely, that'd be great for a day. Or would you be like, oh, nightmare, dressed up like that for a whole evening. I'm too comfy to do that stuff. Like, I like dressing up, like, it was nice to dress up for the wedding and stuff, but... Like, this is too extreme. I'd be like, what are we doing? I'll go as a peasant, all right? I'll go as a monk. I'll wear a robe. Pretend I'm Obi-Wan in my mind. Uh, dressing up like that would make me want to go even more. Down, yes, yes. Without hesitation, yes. Just me, then. Party time. Hey, there's uh, Joanna. What's she doing? Is that Ant with Antoine? Strolling about the revolutionary salon, you spot Antoine. The young firebrand is talking with another woman, but he seems suspicious of her. As you get closer, you recognize Joanna. What's she doing here? Oh, Yvette, it's so unexpected to see you here. Joanna greets you placidly enough that you can't tell if she's being sarcastic or not. Ah, you two have met? Yes, I trust her. I have, and I wouldn't be quick to trust her. Joanna, what are you doing here? I'm here because I've heard so much about the forward thinkers here. I was told this salon was an entire cadre of intelligent persons willing to explore new ideas. Hmm. Don't worry, Ioana. Eh, it's me. Don't worry, Ioana. My friend Yvette is merely being cautious. As you can imagine, free thinking isn't always looked kindly upon by those who claim mastery of our nation. It's all right, Ioana continues. Antoine, I'm told you're looking to expand the common people's liberties. Antoine smirks. Whoever said that does me a great disservice. I'm looking for nothing less than the end of tyranny. Hmm. Joanna narrows her eyes. Certainly a romantic notion, but extremely open-ended. How do you define the end of tyranny? Huh. When people have become free, establish wise laws, the revolution is complete. She leans in. What then does one say of a ruler who already reigns with wise laws? Hmm. Still unacceptable. A tyrant can do away with wise laws at their pleasure. <laughs> Our companion, Yvette, is absolutely right. Every undisputed ruler, even ones with good intentions, is bad for society. Everyone's liberty depends on that ruler's whims. Yes. One cannot rule innocently. 
Even the act itself is a high crime against one's fellow man. Hmm. Joanna sighs in frustration. I see why people call you a fanatic, Antoine. <laughs> I shall choose to take that as a compliment. Those who make revolutions by halves do nothing but dig their own graves. Duly noted. However, I must excuse myself as I have other appointments to take care of. With that said, she leaves. Antoine watches her carefully as she recedes into the crowd. Like, hey, that Joanna woman, what do you think she wants? Nothing good. I don't trust her. Then you and I are the same mind. Something feels concerning about that woman. Huh? Growing up, my mum had a booth at a Victorian country Christmas art show. I would dress up in Victorian era clothes, do my hair, wear fancy hats, and help her. Dress was mandatory. That's cool. A lot of fun to be part of. Walk around, see the different various developments. Some people put minimal effort in, but a lot of them went all out. Kind of like going to one of those Renaissance fairs or something. Um, let's just get some gossip. I want some credibility, but... See, can any of these raise my credibility? This one. Banging on the door. Who is it? Madam, I'm a messenger who's travelled a long way at great haste with grave news. You open the door and see a young messenger sweating profusely. A horse outside pacing anxiously back and forth. He frantically looks around the otherwise empty room. Excuse me, but can you help me find Madam Marie de Lorraine, the Countess de Brion? I have grave and potentially scandalous news for her. We can't risk being spotted. Tell me the news and I'll deliver it for you. <laughs> a credibility check. Medium, and I have 20 cred. Try. We can't risk it, he asks slowly. No, I shall fall prey to such vile trickery out of my way. None of these work for me, man. Don't know why I bother trying. Like, it's a shame that these are the same every time. You know? Just want to follow the story. And Twan's grown on you. Yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe they all would. They're all probably written to grow on us. But it just seems like we've fallen into... Antoine's clutches by uh, way of going for the revolution. I wanted to see more of that priest. I think he's still knocking around, but... The bourgeoisie and the revolutionaries of the Third Estate have been slowly gaining, around in the, gaining ground in the public eye. Their claims that the system is unfairly balanced ring more true every day. People all across the country starve. Every day, mutters of discontent grow louder and louder. The longer this impasse lasts, the more the tension will build. However, if it keeps building, it won't be long before something snaps. And so, in Paris, life goes on. In, when you try to be dramatic and you mess up the line. In Paris, life goes on. There you go. Well done, chap. Okay, cancel date. Explore Paris. We've got two fatigue. Mm, 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 mm. Here's the priest. Should we see the priest? What else do we have? A fabric shortage for the dressmaker. Or... Joanna. Let's see, priesty boy. Ludovico. <gasps> Bonsoir, little Levette. I see you're taking in some fresh air as well. Please join me as I wander aimlessly through the city, she says with a smile. I would hate for this to become dull. I... I was on my way to see a priest, madam. I... The two of you walk closely together, taking in the city and talking about the events of the last few weeks. As always, Madame Gazelle is composed but extremely opinionated. <gasps> oh my god. Like the devil and the angel on my shoulder. As you turn a corner, you nearly bump into the priest, Ludovico, as he stumbles away from a close call. You notice he has a book about the pirates of the Barbary Coast tucked under his arm. Oh, me dispassi! Are you two all right, huh? 
after it's been confirmed that none of you have been put in mortal peril, he looks around and asks, You are allowed to hear, wandering the streets at dusk. Are you too lost? <sighs> We're not lost, priest. Nor are we in need of your help. In fact, I would ask that you stay out of our business altogether. <laughs> How disappointing. When presented with a chance to choose grace and kindness, you instead dismiss it outright. Disappointing, but not a surprising. It doesn't take long to see that this quarrel is not merely romantic in nature. It seems that the church and the bourgeoisie don't agree on something important. The walk continues under a cloud of tension and awkward silence. Well, it is now truly reaching a late hour and I should actually head home. Would you care to join me, Yvette? Oh, do you mind if I join you? I have something to ask Yvette as well, Ludovico asks, seemingly oblivious. Uh, you see, I was hoping to speak with Yvette alone, Madame Gozelle mumbles, a rare occasion where her words have begun to fail her. You notice them both glancing frantically back to you, waiting for an answer. <sighs> with a medium credibility check, you could get him to come with you. I have zero credibility, and these have failed me so often, it's a shame. I think we have to go with Madame Gazelle here. Like, save the priest for another run, maybe. I don't want to disappoint her. We've come too far. Sorry, Ludovico. We can talk later. Marvelous, Madame Gazelle replies. Excuse us, Father Sidotti. Yvette and I have some business to attend to. Ha! Hmm. Ah, I see. Hopefully our paths will cross again. <laughs> Ciao. After Ludovico leaves, you and Madame Gazelle start to walk back to her estate, together. The night air is unexpectedly cool tonight and you feel a chill run across your skin. Noticing your shiver, Honorade pulls you closer. As you talk, it becomes quite obvious to you that Madame Gazelle had no special business with you. Getting you alone all to herself was a more symbolic action of devotion than anything else. Mm -hmm. Eventually you find yourself in front of her estate, an elaborate fashionable Rococo building that sits back for, <laughs> I'd rather have a bowl of Rococo pops from the street and behind a gate. The windows are shrouded by gauzy black curtains. This is where we part ways for tonight, little Yvette. Don't worry, Renee will make sure you get home safely. As she heads inside, Madame Gazelle directs Renee to ready her personal carriage to provide you with a suitable way home. Beats walking. A short time later, you find yourself arriving at your charming yet dilapidated home. Okay. Interesting, interessant. The Estates General has led to some interesting quandaries. The King made it clear he plans to set a bold new direction for France, but it's been unclear what it actually means. To that end, yesterday revealed one of the strangest such pitfalls known in the country. A memory. The incident sends a uh, wear a hat. At a preliminary meeting for the Estates General, the King took off his hat to salute the assembled members. In response, as per custom, all the assembled nobles and commoners removed their hats as a sign of respect. However, after this greeting, only the King and the nobles were supposed to put their hats back on, while the members of the Third Estate were supposed to remain without. Whether this was an act of clear rebellion or a mere confusion in the face of ancient and arcane ceremony, many members of the Third Estate put their hats back on their functionality signal that they felt themselves the equals of the nobility and the king. For reasons that even you find unclear, this whole affair was deemed utterly scandalous. Not just the queen, many have already seen this incident as a harbinger of more disorder to come. Boo-hoo. But, 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 those scenes need artwork, I think. Those should be cut scenes with art on the screen. I know art costs a lot, but... They're like the weakest part of the game. Okay, a date with Antoine. The Revolution. That one. So now, this is our third time here with him. Is it the same? Maybe it's this maybe it's more just a way to quickly get a lot of um, favor with them that then unlocks more things, you know? Same. But maybe doing that unlocks other things to happen, which are actually the different things. I don't know. We, uh, need a rest. A rest day. Who's this? The crown. Um... 
I don't even know who represents the crown as a love interest. Let's go to the party and see if we can see them. A date with Antoine. <laughs> Just... It's the same every time. Yes, fine. A date with Alex? I don't think so. Our love, our betrothed. Okay. Bodyguard. Gossip. Gossip, gossip, gossip. Balance of power. We have to go sell our rumors. And I also want to do this one, foreign entanglements. Let's go sell our rumors before everything gets not fresh. It'll become like you lose what it's worth, I think. Oh my god, we have not been here in quite some time. Look at all that gossip we've collected. Someone was focusing a little bit. Oh, and now look how cheap it all is. It's all old. Oh, bloody hell. You should be able to come here without it taking a day, dude. It's meant to be 30 and it's worth three. Absolute waste of my time. Where's the sell all button? Oh, yuck. All right, sell the new stuff. Pedal influence the power. Increase the revolution. Sell the bourgeoisie gossip. Increase their power. Sell. Sell. Bah, 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 bah. I'm just a wide-eyed peasant girl. I don't know what I'm doing. It's not my bloody fault. I can't even pronounce both daces. Get this gossip out of my pockets, man. Na -na -na. You look up. Rent is due. Ain't nothing going on but the rent. A crown party. That one. Huh. Oh, if I skip, if I click that bottom one, I get to skip all of that beginning stuff. Huh. Anyone here look romanceable? Gossip. Elizabeth. A painter locked in a conversation with an amateur art critic. Oh, it is her. This chick. You happen across a man with an arrogant air about him, talking to a woman. Well, it would be more accurate to say that he's talking at her. We've all been there. Right, sisters? The woman appears to be doing her best to remain civil and just draw in her sketchbook. Men. Furthermore, it might even be obvious to you that your work peaked at the 1783 Salon. Why else would all of your portraits of women look the same after that? Taking a moment to acknowledge you with a nod, the painter returns to her conversation. Her reply is calm, almost bored. My clients dress however they wish for their portraits. My role is merely to capture them as they are in their lives. Is it wrong that so many women wish to look like Her Majesty? Realising the ground he's treading on, the critic's reply is suddenly more delicate. There's nothing wrong with an admiration for the Queen, however that's not the point. The point is you've reached your ceiling because you stopped focusing on your own merits. Instead you chose to attach yourself to... I'm sure this is really interesting to someone, but I'm done now. Madame Lebrun replies, closing her sketchbook. She looks to you. Madam, would you like to talk somewhere else? I'd love to. The critic sputters indignantly. What? You can't just walk away from a critique of your work? You're not my teacher, and this isn't a critique, because I don't want one. What? Critique is something you ask someone for. I never asked for your opinion, so I don't need to listen to it. <sighs> Damn. Pardon, monsieur, but we have an appointment where we have to be anywhere else. The critic's eyes flash with barely suppressed rage, and he hisses at both of you. 
Laugh behind your hands while you still can. The self-importance of yours can't last forever, Lebrun. He storms off in an angry huff, leaving the two of you at peace. Well, that was satisfying to watch. I should invite you to some of my exhibitions. After a few moments of silence, she turns to you. Who are you, anyway? Do you remember that woman that the Viscountess de Foix absolutely loathes? Yeah, that's me. She's like... No, not that one. She's this. Yeah, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got myself in this situation. This Countess de Foix, she murmurs to herself. Why does that name sound familiar? Oh, I painted a portrait of her a few years ago. I don't think it wasn't my best work, but the pay was good. That must mean that you're Yvette de Coe, I take it. Before you can reply, she chimes in again. Please, just call me Elizabeth. Formality doesn't suit me. To what do I owe this infamous honour? I'm looking for my field, my missing fiance. Why do I feel like we were supposed to meet this girl in like chapter one? I'm looking for my missing fiance. She's like, are you all right, dear? You found him. The whole town knows. I rescue people from conversations with boorish idiots. <laughs> oh, you like to play the heroine? She replies with a surprised giggle. Though, if you thought he was bad, Let's just say he's not even the worst one out there, and I've had a few years worth of experience to learn that. You chat a while longer, but find that you run out of common conversation points quickly. Sorry, I must go. There's some other business I need to attend to. She inclines her head to the crowds of people scattered elsewhere. Perhaps I'll see you again soon? Huh. Perhaps, she replies with a thin smile. Follow her. <laughs> just go straight over to her. In the same room. She's like, perhaps. And we just like walk behind her. Hello again. You notice the painter Elizabeth and decide to chat with her. She glances about and leaves the room. Confused but unperturbed, you follow her outside into the gardens. Approaching her, you survey the area and it seems there's nobody else out here except for you two. Unless your heartbeat quickens when you notice shapes that might be following you. Until you realise it's a young couple giggling furtively between themselves. As they disappear together into a hedge maze, it's safe to assume that they'll be occupied with that for a while. Now you're alone with Elizabeth. When you finally catch up with her, she's circling a tree, staring pensively into its branches. Is there a reason you ran away when I showed up? She looks at you, confused and exasperated. What? No, I didn't even know you were there. It's just that... This face... Oh! My daughter Julie wanted to come with me tonight, so I brought her, but then I ran into a potential client. I must have gotten so distracted setting up a meeting with him that I stopped paying attention to her. She must have gotten bored and wandered off. I know how much she likes climbing trees, and a few moments ago I'm certain I saw her little legs scurrying up this one. Now I'm out of here, though. I, I can't see her at all. Huh. Now I know why she was so insistent on wearing that dark green dress tonight. Here's some parenting advice. Never spend an evening teaching your curious and precocious daughter about colour theory. Apparently all she'll learn from it is how to camouflage herself. Shouldn't have brought her here. Don't be so hard on yourself, you just wanted your daughter to have fun. Uh -huh. Merci beaucoup. It's nice to know that at least someone here thinks I'm doing the right thing. I always attend these things by myself, because I'm really here to find new clients to paint. Unfortunately, unfortunately, little Julie doesn't really understand that. She just knows Mama is going to another fancy ball with all the queens and princesses. Every time, she begs me to let her come along. She shakes her head and looks up at the tree again. Why are children always so eager to grow up? Well, she asked me again today and I let her win. I thought maybe she was old enough. Now I can't find new clients and my own daughter probably thinks li my life is stupid and boring. You stand there and try to think of something to say, but you honestly found your parents' own lives pretty boring yourself. Part of the reason you're even here. You're saved by the sound of rustling branches. <laughs> I'm just a bird. A bird who is thirsty. Mon Dieu, Julie. Do you have any idea how worried I was? Come down here right now. I will climb up there if I have to. She hikes up her skirt. It might be a good idea to intervene before Elizabeth is caught scaling a tree. Child, do not test me. I will cut down this tree if I have to. Um, 
I mean, you can stay up there if you don't want a slice of the Queen's cake. I'll have it. What? Eh, yeah, right, there's a Queen's cake. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's covered in special icing and honey flowers that you're not allowed to have anywhere else, but maybe you're just not old enough for it, Elizabeth chimes in. Well, it's coming. Julie scurries down the tree and returns to her mother. Elizabeth mouths a silent thank you to you. Thank you. Like that. Thank you. You know, people like whisper, they mouth something, but they whisper it as well. Thank you. Thank you. While she cleans some twigs and turn off of her errant daughter's dress. This is like if we got with her, we'd be a mum. We'd have a kid. With her daughter finally secured and accounted for, Elizabeth heads inside to the rest of the party in order to find some cake that looks suitably royal. You're left to your own devices and decide to head inside. Well. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I don't know. Any interest in that character? I get it. She's a mum. She's trying her best, but otherwise kind of bland, huh? Only our first two times meeting her, but show me something. Hearing a trill of laughter, you turn away from your reflection and notice that woman, Joanna, approaching you. She's holding onto the arm of a particularly powerful gentleman, but you can tell she's the one guiding his steps. Huh. Yvette, I can't believe that you're here. I was just telling this fine gentleman here all about you. It's such a shame to hear about how the Viscountess de Foix absolutely humiliated you in front of all those people. I can't imagine how awful it felt to endure such a vile debasement. Truly unfortunate. The gentleman with her looks over and gasps. I remember hearing of this. Such unfortunate business, she says with pity. Which is not exactly the emotion you hope to inspire in people tonight. Wow, my credibility. Okay, Joanna, a B word. Of course, didn't you manage to reveal that the perfidious Marcel woman to be a pretender to her title? Who can really trust opinions of such a creature? I'm certain her attacks on your character were as false as her name. Credibility up. Well, things considered, you've done quite well for yourself, Ioana says, scrutinising you carefully. In a provincial village like yours, I can see why Armand would have taken quite a liking to you. Hmm. Spoken truly like a person who's always had resources to work with. Every resource I have I clawed from the dirt of my circumstances, she hisses at you. Do you think it was easy getting named the sole heir to what little my family had left after they'd squandered it? Every step I've taken since then has taken me higher. Higher in stature, higher in society, higher in peril. I have succeeded at everything I've touched. It is who I am. The fact that Armand can't see that when I'm... Excuse-moi, Madame de Jardin, the gentleman at her side interjects. When we spoke earlier, you described yourself as a woman of modest means. What is this talk of inheritance and greater fortune? <gasps> oh, my glass seems to have run terribly dry. You want to gasps in an imitation of surprise. Monsieur, would you mind fetching me a drink? <laughs> what? But of course. Huh. With that, he departs, leaving you alone with Joanna. The woman wastes no time stepping closer to you, her voice low. Looking at the greater picture, I knew I shouldn't be bothered by you. In fact, we should have absolutely no zero interest of each other. We're merely two women trying to make our own lives better. However, whether I like it or not, I hit the button again. The way she says the word years, it sounds like a jagged scar being reopened. God damn it! Why don't you show you? I simply don't know what to do with you. I can't tell if this is a threat or a romantic advance. Either way, get it over with. Huh. You dare to make a fool of me? Oh my god, that was a lot of peril. Uh -huh. Well played, Joanna says with a sudden smile. I'll stay on my toes around you. Cred. Well, should get going. My date has yet to return with my drink, and he still needs to be convinced that he should be donating money to further a certain political club's Beneficent activities. She's annoying. I hate her father. <laughs> Lemon tea. June. Let's push the story forward. It's not a long walk to the address that Armand provided in his letter. 
When you see the address, it's a tavern. You can see a very little light coming from inside. The front door is shut, along with a sign on it that reads, Closed for private event. A slot in the top of the door snaps open, and a pair of skeptical eyes glare out at you from the opening. Through the open slot, you can hear the sound of multiple people speaking in low voices. Who are you? What do you want? You can see who I am. Let me in and stop wasting my time. As much as I would hate to admit it, you're right. I would know that arrogance anywhere, the voice replies. The slot slams shut, the door opens, and you step inside. It takes a few seconds for your eyes to adjust to the darkened interior. You turn... Oh, this guy! You turn around to examine the person guarding the door and come face to face with Marcel's doorman. Bonsoir, madame, he says, shifting awkwardly from foot to foot. Wow. What's he doing here? Uh -huh. Right this way, he replies, pointing you in Armand's direction. Armand looks up from his current conversation and starts heading over with a giant grin on his face. Thanks, Jerome. I'll take it from here. His hand placed lightly on your elbow, he steers you into a secluded corner. Thank you so much for coming, he says while he hugs you close. Here are our plans for tonight. He continues while gesturing out to the crowd behind you. We have all these guests who are in Paris for the Estate General, representing the various estates. While they know the general agenda of our society, they naturally have their reservations about joining us. I've been called into a special meeting tonight, but Joanna is going to be helping you. So I've already been demoted to Joanna's assistant. Lovely. Yeah. Yvette, can you please not fight me about this? I really need your help. I was supposed to be the one helping Joanna tonight, but I was pulled into this meeting instead. Begrudging. Why am I losing fate? Why is he upset at me? Begrudgingly, you take your leave and search for Joanna. However, when you do find her, she already appears to have started to work without you. As a man representing the second estate from such a traditional and storied lineage, I understand that this must be difficult for you, Joanna says, her words flowing like honey. Yes, well, my family has proudly served all the strongest kings of France. However, his majesty does not appear to be cut from the same cloth. He vacillates, issuing stern decrees in the morning. Oh, wait, that's still him speaking. Bloody hell. <laughs> sake. He vacillates, issuing stern decrees in the morning and retracting them at the first sign of resistance by supper time. Sick of these men in these wigs with their same stupid face. It's embarrassing. Well, I can assure you, monsieur, that bringing France under the wing of Austria would strengthen France, the monarchy and the nobility as a whole. Joseph II is a strong emperor working to consolidate power, not let it disperse to undeserving inferiors. Well, madam, if this emperor is consolidating power, how would I benefit? You wouldn't. Don't like this club. Hmm, credibility is pretty low. It's not about helping yourselves, it's about helping France. If I wanted to hear such base talk, I would listen to the revolutionaries. In case you're unaware, they don't have an interest in helping men in my position. In fact, if they had their way, my entire lineage wouldn't exist at all. Oh dear. He storms away from both of you, his displeasure as palpable as a bucket of cold water thrown in your face. Mm. I'm simply amazed at how poorly you managed to handle that, Joanna hisses at you. Armand will hear of this. What? As if she has the power to make me lose favour with him. Without another word, Joanna strides over to the next guest. Younger, carrying a sober bearing of a representative of the Third Estate. Highly agitated and aggressively serious. Follow my example, we'll have this done quickly. Bonsoir, monsieur. I'm Joanna de Jardin, and I've been told you are a well-respected judge from Hanon, ordering the Austrian Netherlands. Is this why you've been so gracious as to show an interest in our humble society? You're very well informed, he admits. Additionally, my family extends beyond France to the other side of the border, and this has been a source of some of my interest. I'm deeply concerned about their future. By all accounts, I agree with Joseph II, especially his edicts of religious tolerance. It sounds good to let a man take on more power, but what about a man who will someday come after him? I'm not getting more peril just to make Joanna happy, and I have, like, no credibility. What is this? A medium check. A choice of kings, he asks, almost confused by your point. What did I do? What the heck was that? <laughs> what the heck is... Some of these scenes, man. God, can I just hang out with Honorade for the rest of the game? Thanks. Okay, what do we have here? So now we have Elizabeth unlocked. 
money, no other thing. A libertine. Mm, mm, mm. Let's do this one. Let's give Elizabeth one more chance. See if she can uh, take our fancy. <gasps> Yvette, what are you doing here? Oh, just wandering the city, hoping I'd run into you. What cheap romance did you pull that line from? Mm -hmm. You're lucky it's charming when you're the one saying it. Yes. I'm out here searching for something interesting to draw. Any ideas? Hmm. Stop into one of the taverns nearby. There might be something there. Would she want to go for, to a tavern? A beautiful fountain? Well. I don't know if she'd want to go to a tavern. If she's from the crown. Fountain or tavern? I feel like if I suggest the tavern, she might be like, um, you're a peasant. What do you think? Should she try and get her drunk? See if she lets some of her personality out. This is her chance. We invite her to the tavern and see if she's like, ooh, yes. Hmm, that could work, she mumbles, more to herself than anyone. Let's go. You stop in at a nearby tavern and take a seat. It's the middle of the day, but the crowd is closely packed. Mm. Perhaps I can work with this, she says as she starts to unpack her supplies. Glancing with some uncertainty about the tavern, she starts drawing. Faster than you've ever seen anyone draw before. There's no hesitation in her movements. Instead, she sketches with the confidence that can only come from decades of practice. After some time, Elizabeth's feverish drawing begins to subside. What started as a storm of lines and sketching winds down to a few careful marks as she works to get everything just so. Eventually, she stops altogether and lays the sketchbook on her lap. Her hands find yours, and you both sit there for a while and just watch the world go by together. Her voice is quiet, barely louder than a whisper. I don't think I'm out of my slump just yet, but I'm still happy you're here. She squeezes your hand slowly, tenderly. Return the affection. Ah. You squeeze her hand back, savoring your closeness together. Your index finger idly brushes along the top of her hand, and for the first time you notice something there, firm and unyielding. Her wedding ring. She notices your change in expression. He doesn't know, and I don't think he needs to. Of course, this is about us. You stay and chat a little while longer, commenting on the strangers at the nearby tables and trying to determine who would be more interesting to draw. Your mind often wanders back to what any of these people would say if they knew the two of you were doing together. Just paces from them. However, none of these strangers notice. Without realizing it, they treat you and Elizabeth like any other pair of people in the world. And it's freeing. Like you've been holding your breath your entire life and are finally able to exhale. As the crowd in the tavern start to move on elsewhere, Elizabeth stands up gathers her things. She stops to scribble a note in her sketchbook, tears out the paper and hands it to you. An address. Write me a letter when you want me to see me again. With that, she walks away, stopping only to glance back one last time before she leaves you in the square. Well. It was cute. That seems like that is a very lovey-dovey angle. Soft partnership, you know? And from one to the other from a simmering fry frying pan into a into a burning fire of passion with one Antoine ba -bong. <laughs> ravishing so let's see if it's unlocked anything new for his date it has not Last night, a mysterious fire erupted in the city, consuming an art studio. What? Rumor has it the studio was raided by the Gwet Royal and left abandoned, considering how easily fires spread in a densely packed city of wooden buildings, tensions around the situation have been high. To that end, some of the nearby buildings sustained damage, but the studio itself was razed to the ground. The Gwet Royal suspects this was arson, and are demanding the public come forth with any information. Is this, um... 
do you think Honorate burnt her thing down? Why does my mind immediately go to... This is Elizabeth's uh, studio. And this is as a result of us going on a date together. You almost immediately recognize the studio as the one you searched for evidence of Armand earlier on in. Okay. It's a testament to your instincts. You searched the building while you had the chance. Whoever burned that studio down was trying to hide something, which means there was something there that the arsonist was willing to risk setting an entire city block ablaze to conceal. It's good you found the evidence when you did, and speaks to the value of the cryptic letter and signet ring you found under the floorboards. Okay. I thought it was like a thing there. Uh, good night, girl scout. What's up, Shade? A cra What's this? A church party. Let's go and speak to the priest at that one, I think. So who's this? Oh, it's the play opening of... For the revolution, okay. Man. Antoine, who's this? Just gossip. You decide to take a quick moment to yourself. You're a reasonably sociable person, but it's important to pace yourself so as not to be overwhelmed. Suddenly, Antoine appears next to you, and without a word, drags you by the wrist into an empty room. Instinctively, you pull back against his grasp, but to no effect. He grip, his grip is like a vice. Antoine. Hey, that. This is a serious problem here. I've received word that one of our political club sponsors has been arrested. Um, Antoine, unhand me. Slowly and silently, Antoine releases his grip on you. You pause to massage some life back into your wrist. I don't know what will become of him. It's obvious we need to check in who our true allies are. It appears Antoine is looking for a direction to reach out to that already agrees with the revolution's ideals. But no matter who he reaches out to, it will increase their power. Bourgeoisie, honorade. Hmm. I should search for a sponsor amongst the bourgeoisie. Money grubbing cravens. Hmm. Of course, I have no illusions as to the self-interest that motivates them, but even they can see the profit in our noble goals. If necessary, can reform them later. We have a pleasant conversation. Okay. Well, need to attend to this business. Bye. Oh, Antoine. Oh, Antoine. <laughs> Sycophantic guest. Which is, of course, why we're glad to have a man of such au august reputation among us, though I must ask, why are you still wearing your judiciary robes? Hmm. Oh, don't worry about this, the judge laughs as he tugs at the edges of his robe. My final trial of the day was running quite late, and I didn't want to disappoint our host. I know she was very eager to see me. You're not certain that's completely true. In fact, you're certain this judge is the sort of person that requires a naval uniform just to take a bath. Oh, who might you me be, madam? Who? Sorry, who might you me? No, I said who might you be, actually. Don't mock me. I'm a judge. I'll throw you in jail. Um, Yvette Decaux, pleasure to meet you. Sure, the honour is all mine, the judge says quickly, not paying much attention to your introduction. Oh Funny, I was almost late, he chuckles. As it happens, my last case of the day involves some prominent revolutionaries. Neither the charges against them or the verdict have yet to be made public. I'd explain further, but this case requires discretion. I'd hate to confuse the young lady. I can assure you both, I'm not easily confused. Yeah. Well, I shall refrain from discussing this case any further. Well said. It's good to be around such keen and sharp minds, Your Honor. The two of them leave, congratulating each other on their shared intelligence. While it means you don't get any gossip related to the case, at least it means you've been able to preserve your dignity. Credibility. Do do get some goss. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Get to the good stuff, man. Five of Juin. Juin. 
we have Ludovico journalism and fabric shortage well to Ludovico it is a lovesick priest Let's see what he's all about that's when you hear him yelling I said piss off screams a man at a young priest you recognize while there are other people in the street the surrounding crowds are ignoring the two so thoroughly that they might as well be in a different country altogether what I did was ask for a donation, states Ludovico, gesturing gently with a small wooden donation box in his hands. Yes. Take it up with a hangman if you care so much, you greedy bloodsucker. Monsieur, why do you have such a venom for the poor? I have nothing but sympathy for my poor countrymen. It's you priests I hate. You take our land, ignore our taxes, build yourselves great churches of marble and gold, then you have the audacity to ask us for money to help the poor. The man spits on the ground. If your Pope cares so much, he can reach into his own pocket, not mine. Both you and Ludovico are struck dumb by this display. Never in your life have you heard someone speak to a priest this way. Monsieur, His Holiness already put a significant effort towards a funding raising aimed at... I swear, if you say another word, I'll thrash you. Hmm. <laughs> Calm yourself, you've proven yourself tougher than a monk. That is such a quality diss. Um, the church is doing something unlike the revolution. Mm, we're with the revolution, though. This is what? A medium check? I'm failing that all day long with full credibility. Stand down, father. He has a good point. Yvette? What? Ludovica replies, noticing you for the first time. How could you say that? The nationalist continues. We've all been swindled for too long. Time for the church to pay its fair share. Ooh, favor with Antoine. <laughs> Ludovico glares at you angrily. I just... I just I cannot believe you. The young priest storms away. The man giving you a no gives you a nod of approval. <laughs> no! Ludovico, come back. <sighs> it's -a me -a. A young revolutionary illegally putting up posters decrying the crown's ineffective response to the famine sweeping France was nearly arrested today. Narrowly avoiding the archers, he fled to the Cathedral of San Luis de Invalidade and tried to declare asylum within the hallowed ground. The military has been called in to apprehend this criminal as this cathedral is part of one of their complexes. The problem, of course, was nobody has seriously attempted to seek asylum within a church in a very long time. Some lawyers would debate as to whether the legal right even still exists. The real question comes down to where the church true loyalties lie. In this case, the priests claiming to be acting towards the preservation of order and public good refused to grant the revolutionary asylum and turned him over to the, the, the soldiers on his shoulders. I wonder if then this changes, this chapter, Seeking Asylum, if you push the church towards the revolution, which is not something we've done. We've been, we've been trying to link up the military, the bourgeoisie, and the revolution. We've ignored the church and the crown, so... The church is on the side of the crown. Crown gained power, church lost power. Okay, so now I have to choose between <laughs> going on a on a date with uh, who is this? Baron Claude and Boise, or Alex, who's dead. Um, so we'll go over here. Ooh, a date with Elizabeth. Sure. A date with Honorade. What do you think? Should we go on a date with Honorade again? Madame Gazelle? Should we accept her invitation? Obviously. Okay, so quite a row of things here um let's we need a rest day before definitely so one of these has to be a rest day we have <gasps> elizabeth and ludovico a choice between i feel like we would just pick elizabeth and ludovico it would be even sadder get a bodyguard journalism or elizabeth on her own Hmm. 
or rest and see what happens tomorrow. I don't know. Maybe rest today. See if they change. Ludovico. I feel like Ludovico would probably be a really fun romance option, actually. Like, he seems pretty interesting. Like, he's a priest, but he's kind of, like, goofy, too. He's like a soft priest, you know? Like, I bet you would suggest something and he'd be like, Oh, it's a so naughty. But he would do it anyway. <laughs> oh, it's a thrilling. Not since my time in the church have I ever experienced. You know. Be fun. Come on, father. Have a drink. Oh, my gosh. Mamma mia. Antoine. Perils of journalism. Ah, see? Now I've lost the good things. No dates. Well, let's go and sell the gossip. Shell. Influence for the revolution. Mm, don't know if we really need the money. More influence for the revolution. There we go. You know, there's no way to actually see the power levels, I don't think. As far as I... Oh, here we go. Power and Allegiance. So for all I've done, focusing entirely on the revolution, they only have two and the crown has one. I would have thought it would have been way more. The church has very little power and is aligned to the crown. The military is aligned to the crown. But I have managed to entirely get the bourgeoisie as a minor faction to be for alliances with uh, the revolution. Alright, what do we have today? Date with Elizabeth. I shall go wearing my humble outfit. Humble yourself. Elizabeth arrives. After taking a moment to carefully look around, she approaches you. Of course this is where we would go together. You look absolutely stunning, she gushes as she looks you over. And you notice her empty hand idly sketching you in the air. Looking away from you, she surveys your location. Elizabeth looks around at Jardin de Plantes and smiles. Avet, this is absolutely lovely. I could use a little relaxation. The two of you stroll together, walking as close as the laws of society will allow, without suspicion. <laughs> Occasionally, you stop to furtively point and giggle together at particular couples. Some of them are just silly and foolish, but others will make for great inspiration for her work later. A few hours later, you realize it's starting to get late. Oh. Oh! After your rendezvous, Elizabeth offers to walk you home. The streets are empty. You walk down the center of the road, arm in arm. You can hear distantly the sound of the city's clamor from other streets. You feel like the only people in the world. She glances at you and opens her mouth to speak, but stops and looks away. She does it again. Elizabeth, is something wrong? She laughs, and while it isn't loud, it feels like a great pressure has been released. Nothing's wrong, I'm sorry, this isn't normally a problem for me. I want to paint a new portrait, but not for a client. I want to make something more personal. Yvette, would you like to pose nude for me? <laughs> um, oh my god. Imagine how exposed you would feel posing nude for like, how long does it take? Like five hours or something for someone to paint you? <sighs> Goodness me. I'd love to. Fantastique. It'll take a few sittings, but you can come by my studio whenever you like. The first sitting is now available to visit. I think we'll both find it very inspiring. She flashes you a smile that was intended to be mischievous, but perhaps signals 
something else. The two of you walk and talk together for a while longer, but your mind is swimming with the possibilities of what you just agreed to. I can't believe this is happening. This is amazing. What did I just agree to? You stare at yourself in the mirror before you go to bed and hesitantly practice a few poses. The thought of someone staring at you naked for hours at time does little to calm your nerves. Fitfully, you manage to get to sleep. The Presh. A church event? Nah. Sorry, Ludovico. Not this run. From there to here. Wearing our little big black dress. The fine dining. Very pleasing. Okay, so this is the same. I just wish... Oh, sorry. Twiddling a pen. I just wish every, um, every date was different. Like, I'm pretty disappointed that the dates are all the same. You know? Uh, after the rendezvous, like, you unlock bits afterwards, but it's just weird that I have to click through that beginning bit and see if I have something. Like, it's unclear. Is it, there's elements of this that feel unfinished, and I know that it was delayed by a couple of months, but just maybe it maybe needed a bit more time in the oven. After the rendezvous, Madame Gazelle insists on giving you a ride back to your home. She's more energetic than usual. Yvette, what would you do suddenly if you had a vast... What would you do if you suddenly had a vast fortune? Um, What would you do, chat? Would you establish several income streams and use leftovers to bury yourself in an avalanche of luxury? Would you, two, relax? After all, you could stop worrying about money. Or three, wealth is influence, and with that wealth, bend the world to your liking. <laughs> Some supervillain in chat. Three. Um... I would establish income streams, Madam Gazelle. Mm -hmm. She barely manages to cover up her laughter with one hand. If nothing else, I bet you are extremely consistent. If it helps, I would like to see you buried in that luxurious avalanche. Of course, you already know that none of my questions are truly idle. These last few weeks, I've been doing my best on learning how to manage my sudden fortune. I finally feel like I actually know what I'm doing. And no, I didn't put any money into wallpaper importing. I've reached a point where I know that I'm safe to make my own decisions, and it doesn't feel like Charles's fortune anymore. I retire to my home, and it doesn't feel like his house anymore. Everything truly feels mine. And something about that leaves me feeling torn. Hmm... You're afraid you're forgetting him. You should have felt like that to begin with. It was always yours. True. Unfortunately, progress doesn't always feel good. Also true. Hmm. Good answers, all of these. But are you afraid you're forgetting him? Huh. That's exactly it, she says with a sad smile. I'm afraid I'll forget him. I know it's ridiculous, but that doesn't make me dread the possibility any less. Of course, while I can actually manage the finances, what I don't have is a purpose. The very nature of being wealthy means that my decisions affect a world much bigger than my own, even when I don't intend to. But all I've determined is that I should be doing something with my fortune other than indulging myself. After all, I have you for that. Every day it feels like Paris is being pulled between such different visions for the future. I think the revolutionaries are right. They're the people, and so am I. Yes. I think you're right. Uh -huh. I'm glad you agree. I'll see what I can do to make sure my spare funds support suitably revolutionary causes. This is the kind of savvy that I appreciate in you. I'd also like to thank you for your patience. I imagine that most of your past romantic dalliances didn't involve someone bringing up their departed spouse so much. At least for your sake, I hope not. Hmm... Tell me more about him. Maybe because she's, like, scared of forgetting him. Make it so she knows that she can still talk about him. It's new to me. That doesn't mean it's wrong. I have to admit, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes. I reckon she'd like to talk about him. Mm -hmm. He was vivacious, kind, and indulgent. 
Life just burned inside him like a furnace, always looking for some new hill to conquer. Of course, it drove him mad to sit still, which sometimes led to him driving me mad, but that was all right. When I was first trying to teach myself how to manage my affairs, I read Charles's journals to see what he was thinking when he made all those decisions. I always knew he was wound a little tight, but I had no idea how afraid he actually was. To him, the world was always two steps from complete disaster. He always had to be taking charge and guiding things to a proper path. Her reverie turns to a wistful smile. I suppose that would explain why his carnal tastes were so... opposite. It was the only place he felt safe enough to let go. I was gonna say, this doesn't sound like the type of guy that would be with her in the bedroom and her style, but... There you go. The opposite, I suppose. If he was like that. Works both ways, doesn't it? <laughs> you lurch forward in your seat as the carriage comes to a halt. Pulling aside the dark curtains, you see you've arrived at your home. Renee opens the door and helps you down out of the carriage. As you turn around to say goodbye, you notice Madame Gazelle's hand hanging down in front of you expectantly. Kiss it. You bend down low and kiss the back of her hand. The hand wraps around your chin and pulls your head upwards. You find yourself with Madame Gazelle staring down at you. Good girl, she murmurs low. Wow, okie dokie then. She presses her lips against yours, gently seizing the back of your head with her free hand. Her touch is gentle, but firm. She lets go of the back of your head and resumes gently holding you by the chin. May go for now. I'll avail myself of you again soon enough. Letting go, she gives a silent signal to Renee, who remounts his coachman's box, cracks his whip, and soon her carriage disappears into the night. It's then that you turn around and realize Camille has been standing there the entire time. Standing stock still, she holds the door open for you, her cheeks flushed red. <coughs> Here comes the... Did, did you enjoy yourself, madam? She stammers. Why, Camille, is that jealousy I hear in your voice? What? N of course not. I'm simply not sure if a woman of your station should let themselves be handled like that, she says, failing to meet your gaze for the entire sentence. That answer feels suspiciously incomplete, but you'll let it pass for now. Wow. Whoa. Honorade. A minx. Hers is definitely the sauciest, but I wonder if it's because we've sort of been picking up her stuff since the beginning. Although kissing uh, Antoine down an alleyway whilst he had a knife ready to, like, protect us was also pretty saucy, I guess. Wow, well. Really? Okay, what is this? For the crown. Where that one? Gazelle. Okay, so at this point, if we had to pick someone, if things suddenly started wrapping up and we had to pick someone as a love interest to continue things with, who are we picking? One, Madame Gazelle. Uh, two, Antoine. Three, Elizabeth. Who's still pretty new, but... I've got to open a window, it's hot in here. today. All ones? Who did we say one is? Honorade? Huh. 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 Wow, everyone, everyone for Madame Gazelle. Huh. Who's in here? Elizabeth. His manners are lacking, but he seems to make up for it with his exuberance. Hmm. Wait a minute, I knew I recognized you. Madame de Co, the young man declares. Aren't you the woman, the Viscountess de Foix, invited to a party just to humiliate them? Credibility down. His next comment disappears mid-sentence. His attention is captivated by someone passing by in the hallway. Pardon me, ladies, but the Duchess just arrived, and I absolutely must speak with her. 
Oh, off to throw your affections at some beautiful young thing already? <laughs> Not exactly, he replies with a proud grin. However, my family's in dire straits, and she's fabulously wealthy, so... Have a drink. I'm not kidding, I literally inhaled that subway after the stream yesterday. I ate it so fast that I thought for a split second, is this how I die? And like, my chest has hurt since. <laughs> like, heartburn for a whole day, because I just went, oh! I was so hungry at the end of that stream. Oh, oh so painful, man. Um... He leaves in order to initiate a transactional romance of the sort that the world has honestly seen quite a few of already. Ah, uh, she sighs. It really feels like everything's coming apart at the seams. Everyone's scrabbling for whatever crumb they can find. What if His Majesty really can't keep France together? I have my daughter Julie to think about, and... Does the Crown even have any friends left? Are we really just sailing on a ship that's disintegrating in a storm? No matter what you say, whoever Elizabeth ends up reaching out to will gain a small boost of power from trust. Oh. Revolution, then. Bourgeoisie. That can't be right. Last I heard, the church is already fawning all over these new revolutionaries. At this rate, there'll be nobody left for me to reach out to at all. Oh, actually, me doing anything with Elizabeth is, like, the crown is the complete opposite to the revolution. Well, regardless, I should still reach out to them, no matter their opinion on His Majesty. Perhaps they'll just like me, personally. Now I feel like I'm playing her, because I'm on the side of the revolution and the bourgeoisie. Oh, well. Oh, well. Let's hope she doesn't end up on the guillotine, eh, when the time comes. Alright, let's click through these, get what gossip we can, or just get out of here. <laughs> Da, 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 da. Uh, picture imagining you eating it like Scooby Doo. It was very it was it was it's the I eat like a duck anyway. But like I was bad. Like literally I was like ten minutes afterwards like Oh is that like am I gonna die? It was a very, very silly way to eat. Too quick, man. It's just like when you take too big a mouthful sometimes and you're like, Well, I've committed now and oh, and then you're like, that was a mistake. Word has drifted in of a violent rebellion at Saint Maur, a small commune to the southeast of Paris. Commoners, artisans fed up with the extortionate price of bread, have taken both the problem and hatchets into their own hands. Frantic bread merchants requested aid from a nearby military regiment, but there was concern the hastily mobilized force might not be good enough. However, their undersupplied regiment, the Anjou, was already overburdened by other tasks when the call for aid came in. By the time they managed to respond to the crisis, the looters had fled with their spoils. The merchants from the bourgeoisie blame their lackluster response on royal officials from the crown not caring enough about the woes of the common people. Revolutionary nationalists have capitalized on this and approached the merchants for talks now to prevent this in the future. The bourgeoisie moved towards the revolution. What is this? Bourgeoisie party. Sure. What do we have today? Church party. Wear this for old times sake. Ludovico. You find yourself chatting with Ludovico, but he seems more weary than usual. Father Sidotti, the hostess is possessed. Also possessed. <laughs> possessed. I think she's possessed. What should we do? Madre de Dio, he gasps. I'm already a young priest. Find me an old priest. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have drifted off. I've just spent several nights meeting with the first estate representative from the estate general. The parish priest from the country want changes to benefit the people who are starving in the streets. The bishops and the deacons in the cities are all from a noble families and I don't want to upset the current order. They administer their churches like their own personal estates. I'm very aware that I've opened my window and the people can hear me doing a loud Italian accent <laughs> in the middle of the night. 
We're supposed to be agents of the Lord, the unified by our mission to protect the souls of our flocks. But it seems like it's too much to hope for. I admit I have my own biases, but they informed by a scripture. After all, the Lord himself said it's easier for a camel to go to the Iron Needle than the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I understand that much of the Bible's wisdom is difficult to interpret, but it feels a pretty step forward to me. <laughs> Still, I mean, why are you talking so much? Still, I've been in charge with looking out for the church's best interest in my report back to Rome. I want to see the time has come to start picking sides. I need to make sure that it's someone that already has a harmonious relationship. What the hell? Of course, whoever this Catholic church will make an overture to get a little power. Oh, wait, that's not actually you. Okay. <clears throat> um, Revolution. Oh. Really? You think that it truly be receptive to supporting the revolution? <sighs> but that can't be right, Ivetta. I really sure who's in charge of the favor. Damn it. Regardless, I suppose it doesn't make a sense for us to begin to support the revolution. They have the people's best interests at heart. Never talking to him again. <laughs> who's this? Church gossip. <laughs> Bloody hell. Wink. On what? Oh my god, how many moves? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Ruin. What's this? A crown thing? Nah. I have so many things coming up. This is a revolution party. That one. Ba -dum -bum. Huh. Huh. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> Do not be great? It would be like an auto, like a uh, auto skip thing for like this. Like, yeah, go get some gossip. Blah 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 blah. So then, if you wanted to, because especially if I did another run, like I would just want to focus on the dates. Like this bit being the same every time. I was like, okay, mm okay. Mm I guess you could just not go to any parties if you wanted to. But I come to them because sometimes the people that you're trying to romance are here. Maybe you could skip them all. A bit tedious like the gossip stuff? Yeah, definitely. I think if you're looking for a, like a romance choose your own adventure, this seems to skirt definitely more towards like choose your own adventure political with a side order of romance. Although that stuff, when it comes, is pretty good. So it's difficult. I think the first chapter was stronger because it had that overarching story of the um, Defois and like trying to catch her out and get like your dignity back. But since we got our dignity back and outed her, it's a little bit like, okay, we'll just focus on the romance then or get the revolution going. Like everything else is kind of at a standstill now. If that makes sense. A group of soldiers from the very company approached the estate general to publicly denounce their own commanding officer. The Duke de Chalot is an enemy of the people. While their proclamations could be heard through the doors, they never got past the guards into the assembly room. They were arrested. Mm, 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 mm. A date with Elizabeth? Let's do it. A date with Alex? He's dead. A date with Honorade? I don't know. Should we go on a date with Honorade, guys? After she kissed me like that? How dare she? Ah. Well. Oh, my exhaustion is so bad. We have to rest. Then we'll go do a nude painting. Get the nudie. Ah, get the nudie. Ludovica walks in. Ah, it's a mama. <laughs> the rent. Luckily... 
I mean, it feels like buying the dresses and stuff is fairly optional unless you're really playing the influence game, so you don't really need too much money. Just double check what else we have. Dressmaker quest. Is that with rumors in the city? Okay. Nude painting. Every time you pass a stranger on the street, you expect them to know somehow, to know you're on your way to a beautiful, fascinating woman's studio so she can paint a nude portrait of you for her private collection. You feel nervous. You feel anticipation. You glance back down at the paper and at the number in the house. You're here. The studio feels like a separate building that's been attached to her house, and while you assume her husband is at work, you see the shapes of servants through the home's windows. Knock on door, walk in. Just walk in. Not wanting to make too much noise, you open the door and step inside, inside the studio. The place is clean, though it's still spattered with dried paint. Shrubs and ivies growing over the windows provide some privacy, but still let the sunlight filter in. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth walks in wearing a paint-spattered apron, carrying a freshly stretched canvas, while you're still in the middle of your inspection. Salut, Yvette. Please come in. Close the door quietly. I don't want my husband's servant to hear us. She leads you to a couch, upholstered in satin. I'll need you to undress and pose for me here. Wait, what kind of painting is this going to be? We already know. Maybe if you don't go... Maybe if you don't have the date before, you don't know. Um, I hope you're ready for this. If you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. Keeping that in mind, you stride over to the couch, disrobing as you walk. The line of discarded clothing forms a trail behind you until finally you drape your corset over the back of the couch. Slowly you recline into a comfortable position. <laughs> that was something else, Elizabeth manages to stammer to you. Are you sure you've never done this before? You give no reply other than an appropriately enigmatic smile. After spending more than a few minutes admiring you, Elizabeth gives you some specifics on how to pose. A wrist here, an ankle there, laying your head back in order to better catch the light on your face. She walks to her easel and, using a piece of charcoal, starts to sketch your position on the canvas. You can't see what she's doing, but you can hear her mumble to herself while she works. From the sounds of it, the sketching is going well. A few minutes pass, you realize how comfortable you are. Despite your vulnerable position, being naked no longer feels different. Like plunging into cold water, the initial shock is really the most noticeable part. Eventually, like the water, it feels calm and refreshing. A few hours pass, punctuated only by occasional break to get up and stretch. Elizabeth won't let you look at the canvas on your breaks, so instead you content yourself staring out the window, at the way the sunlight plays with the leaves on the vines. I have the framing and positioning set. How would you like me to depict you? Make me gorgeous like a queen. Depict me as I am, beauty and honesty. Paint me as you see me. That way it can be about both of us. I'm a queen! Uh, paint me as you see me. Hmm. Elizabeth doesn't reply at first, instead stares at you quizzically, as if uncertain that you're serious. <laughs> Eventually, she breaks into a broad smile. I think I'd like that very much. She starts drawing again with fresh energy, scribbling with her charcoal all over the canvas. When you finally break for the day, Elizabeth takes off her canvas apron, makes some tea, and brings out a few small pastries while you get dressed. She's feeding me? All right. I'll, put, I'll pose nude whenever you want. <laughs> pastries are involved. In the midst of devouring said pastries, you realize you're surprisingly hungry for someone who's spent the day sitting in one place. After spending an hour chatting and looking at your figure sketched on the canvas, you head home. What a day. Oh, what a day. <laughs> Military party. I'm going to start skipping the parties, I think. More so, even. Once we finish these ones. Alright, for the bourgeoisie, and I will go wearing Honorade's special outfit. Bum, 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 bum. Three turns. Uh -huh. Bum, bum, bum. Uh -huh. mm, 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 mm. Skipping. There she is. You hear shuffling behind you. The room goes dark as someone comes up behind you and places their hands over your eyes. 
Guess who? A sultry voice whispers in your ear. Armand? Imagine. They're very bold to play this game in front of so many strangers. It's got to be on a raw day, right? Mm -hmm. mm, a mere lucky guess, she replies, but you can hear the smile in her voice. She drops her hand from your eyes and you turn around to find yourself face to face with none other but Madame Gazelle. I'm in a great mood and I'd like to celebrate it with you. First, however, we need to find somewhere quiet. She grabs you by the hand and leads you away to a distant corner of the party. Your progress through the crowds of the party is surprisingly slow. People keep stopping the two of you to pay their respects to Madame Gazelle and ask for her opinion on various matters particular to the bourgeoisie. You also can't help but notice how many guests' eyes linger on the way that she's holding your hand. Nobody says a word, but they do watch. Finally, the two of you manage to find an empty room in the party, forgotten by other guests. A low fire burns in the fireplace, but nobody is here. She slowly shuts the door behind you and takes a seat in a big, overstuffed chair. Sit, she commands, pointing to a spot on the floor in front of her. <coughs> sit on the floor. Careful to make sure that you don't step on your own dress, you sit on the floor in front of her. Your legs curled off to one side and your body propped up on one hand. She looms over you and smiles. Good girl. The two of you engage in little snippets of conversation, all of them meaningless. Instead, the both of you are focused on each other. The entire party going on in the other room fades into the background as you slowly let go of yourself, let yourself be made lesser than another, let yourself be controlled. You can't even remember when the conversation stopped, but both of your wrists are in Madame Gazelle's hands, and her lips are drifting so close to yours. Suddenly, your spine goes stiff at the sound of the door opening. A woman walks into the room. Both of you go still as statues. She looks disgusted by what she sees, but also completely unsurprised, as if she was looking for something. What exactly are the two of you doing? We're in the middle of a romantic moment here. Do you mind? My peril is so high. Oh my god. I fell. Madame Gazelle was good enough to help me up. I've had too much wine. Credibility, of which I have none. I guess I have to go with the top one, but to see what happens, because either way, I'm screwed. Uh, nothing. I don't want to do her like that, though. I don't know. What would she respect more? Probably being like the middle of a romantic moment. Now big gone. But that would like maybe get me killed. This peril. Top one. Hmm. <sighs> After a pause, Madame Gazelle agrees. Right. It's nothing at all. The interloper seems surprised, yet also smugly satisfied. Like wielding this power is what fulfills her. Good. I thought as much. I'm just trying to stay alive, man. I would have done the middle one if I didn't have... The peril, like I'm so close to dying and this stupid credibility system. Messing up my game here. The pall they cast over the room remains and Madame Gazelle sighs and stares at the ceiling. The two of you sit together in stony silence. I know I said I was in a great mood before, but this is, that was, she trails off, never completing the sentence, she doesn't need to. Suddenly she stands up, the shine of tears welling up in her eyes. Sorry, Yvette, I just need to... I just... She leaves. Lost a little favour with Madame Gazelle. Don't worry, it's not really your fault. Ah. You glance around the room, nothing except a low fire and a sense of heartache. Let it go, find that woman. <sighs> Screw it! Unable to stand this indignity anymore, you stand up in a whirl of finery and fury. You rush out the door to find this interloper and tell her exactly what you think of her disgust. You can't hear anything other than your own breathing and the blood flowing faster and faster through your veins. The anger is so overwhelming that it's become intoxicating. Hurtling from room to room, you come upon her, merrily talking with other guests as if nothing had ever happened, as if she was innocent. Words of purest venom issue forth from your mouth with such speed and violence that you don't even remember what you said. What you do remember is the looks on the faces of everyone who heard you say it. None of the other guests have had any context for this display of fury. All they know is you are willing to come to Madame Gazelle's defense in a most spectacular fashion. Even if they don't approve of it, they seem to respect it. Gained credibility, but my peril is now at 100. The rest of the evening is a blur. 
You're not even sure if you did anything else at the party before you headed home. Well, we had to for Madame Gazelle. Credibility check. Maybe I can save some peril. No. It appears your life has taken a sharp turn, as the consequences for the peril you've accumulated so far have come home to roost. Your various social missteps and misdeeds have earned you much scorn. The rumor mill you yourself make use of has been turned against you. Buy credibility. Lose favor with everyone. With their wrath expanded upon you, you have managed to gain some breathing room. Lost peril. Okay. Bum 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 bum. I should have just had a back straight away, huh? Bloody hard to know, isn't it? A date with Elizabeth. Na 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 na. You look stunning. Uh -huh. uh, you walk home. You sense she feels much more comfortable with you. You sense tension in the air. It feels like she has something on her mind. Did I ever tell you what it was like to paint the queen? Were you nervous? Uh. My heart nearly leapt out of my chest when I got the invitation. I had a good reputation. I'd painted nobility before, even a few relatives of the Queen, but those were formal paintings. I would show up, chat with them a little, try to capture the essence of someone I didn't even know. Marie was something else entirely. Instead, I met Marie and her friends at La Petite Triomont and joined them in their leisure. I saw them as themselves, not as the masks they wore at court. By then, Marie had been rejected enough times to be sick of politics and intrigues. Instead, she spent her efforts making a simple world of leisure in that chateau, like a little island isolated from the rest of France. We became friends of a sort. She turns her eyes away from you to the ground. Later on, my career stalled. The members of the Academy were blocking my membership. I ran out of options and I asked the Queen for a favour. Marie never questioned my motive. She didn't even think about it. She just did it. Suddenly, I was a member. She pauses for a moment as if not sure if she should continue. What happened? Huh. She stutters. I'll remember the 1783 Salon for the rest of my life. I made two paintings. Peace Bringing Back Abundance was there to show that I could do more than portraits, but my real focus was Marie en chemise. I poured my heart into that painting. I was relaxed, calm, kind. It was the Marie I knew. It was the Marie I wanted to show the world. They hated it. I was surrounded by all these men, these master artists whose work I admired. I had to listen to them tear it to pieces. That my portrait was scandalous, that it was insulting, that it was unbecoming of the Queen. I heard it over and over again. The Queen made a mistake. Her eyes glisten wet. They took it down on the first day of the show. I thought my career was over. A duo of tears rolled down her cheeks. But it wasn't. My infamy only brought me more clients. The common people loved it. Marie was more damaged by the scandal than I was. A few years later, I painted another painting of her, something with her children. I made what the Academy wanted to see, more austere, more appropriate, something befitting the mother of the King's children. Since then, Marie and I have lost touch. I feel like I betrayed her. Oh, perhaps you should look elsewhere. Have you considered talking to the Nationalists? Um, this isn't your fault. Those boars just couldn't tolerate a woman in their special club. That's the worst part. My rival, Adelaide La Bigon, became a member that same year. No connections at court, no backroom dealing. One of the only other women in the entire academy. She earned it. I wasn't good enough to do it on my own. Perhaps I should just... Elizabeth, you'll never heal this hurt with silence. Reach out to the Queen as a friend. Ah. She sniffs and wipes tears from her face. Maybe you're right. It was Leah Kadama that hated my painting, not Marie. I put my heart into something for a friend and she loved it. That's what matters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You arrive at home. Camille greets you both with you. Camille sees everything. She sees me come back with Antoine, Elizabeth. She's seeing Honorade kissing me, patting me on the head. Oh, who's this delight, Yvette? Just a maid of all works, madam. Can I get either of you anything? You two seem to be getting along quite well. Should I be worried? Hmm. The question draws silence. Oh. <laughs> Followed by raucous laughter. Whoa. 
I, bet I didn't take you for the jealous type, Elizabeth replies with a wink. You're not certain, but you're pretty sure that you saw Camille blush for a moment when she said that. Camille's totally secret romance ending, right? After a few minutes of the three, if you're trading jokes and raised eyebrows, it winds down enough for you to excuse yourself. With your goodbyes said, you head upstairs. It was a good night. You feel like you've managed to push events in a helpful direction. Run away with the maid. For the last few weeks, discussions at the Estate General have been dragging out and growing ever more divisive. Enraged by their unfair representation, representatives of the Third Estate have created their own body called the National Assembly and invited members of the other states to join them in negotiations on what would in theory be fairer ground. This is, of course, in direct conflict with the orders of the King, and these sections totally feel like I'm reading an essay on Wikipedia, who determined the voting system used in the Estate's General nobility in the First Estate have called on the Crown to issue a swift and decisive condemnation of this rebellious act. <sighs> However, His Majesty King Louis, the numbers has yet to issue any official statement on the National Assembly report, suggest he has instead chosen to spend the last few days in a long meeting with the courtiers of his Privy Council trying to reach a decision. And so in Paris, life goes on. Who's this? A party? Nah. The second sitting. Mm-hmm. We're like, what, eight, nine hours into this now? And I swear, I looked at Steam reviews and there's people with like four or five hours and they're like, loved my first playthrough. I'm like, how? Is it because I'm reading everything? Does it really take that much longer? Remembering Elizabeth's need for discretion, you simply walk inside. The studio is exactly how you remember it, though your portrait's canvas has been covered with a cloth. Entering a room, a startled Elizabeth practically jumps when she sees you. Mon Dieu. I, yeah, I did go to, like, every single party in Chapter 1 when we did that five-and-a-half-hour stream, but... Still, bloody hell. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you come in. She flashes you a smile. Still, glad you took my request seriously. All right, I already have everything I need set up. Let's begin. I'd appreciate some help getting ready if you have the time. What's that, like, saying undress me? Of course, stand back and watch. Would, would one be telling her to take my clothes off? I feel weird to tell her to stand back or just get undressed. Let's see. Uh -huh. Oh, I thought you'd never ask. Elizabeth replies with a sly smile. She helps you out of your dress and slowly unlaces your stays, hands lingering on you all the while. You're pretty sure it took longer to undress with her help than it would have taken to do it yourself. But that was the point, really, wasn't it? This time, she starts with her paints, filling in the colours that define the scene. While you can't see what she's doing, she tells you about the process. Getting the balance of colours is important to making a scene feel authentic, even to an untrained eye. Subtle details like the colour of the light reflected off a wall can make all the difference in the world. Hopefully, she does a really good painting and I can keep it in my attic and, you know, never age. An hour into the sitting, she laughs. I like how easy it is to talk to you. Much easier than trying to reach out to new patrons. Half the critics in the city already paint me as a conniving narcissist, and I'd hate to prove any of them right. Instead, I just sit around and wait for work to come to me. Even though I know it's unwise, artists have to keep reaching out for clients or we'll never get anything. So out of practice, what if I make a fool of myself? Mate, am I a lover or a life coach? Come on. Laying naked here, waiting to get painted. The bourgeoisie. Huh. That feels sensible, she admits, already considering the idea. What I need right now is clients. I'd rather have ones that can pay well than ones that can't. Huh. Thanks, Yvette. I'll send out letters to some of the business leaders in Paris tomorrow. The conversation trails off and you spend the next hour simply buzzing and watching Elizabeth paint. She seems more relaxed as if a weight's been lifted from her mind. Where is the passion? Where is the spice? All right, my hands are starting to cramp up. I think we're done for the day. Great. Do I want to see what you've done? I'd rather be surprised. Huh. Oh, interesting. Like last time, Elizabeth fetches pastries and tea and you get the feeling she does this with all her clients. It's nice to have all the same. You chat and joke for a while, which is a lot easier to do. Now you don't have to hold perfectly still. One last sitting for the portrait. Who's this? Honorade. Now we're talking. 
So, the first part, the same. She judges what we're wearing. It's interesting, but listen, I think there's a feature missing here because this segment, she judges what you're uh, wearing, right? And here, look. Oh, I adore this place. The food is exquisite. The decor is excellent. You know how much I love being served. Like she's judging my choice of setting. I don't see... She sends me a letter. I don't pick where to go. I feel like there's an unfinished feature in terms of where you pick the date. Because when we go to locations as well, it says location unlocked. You can now do rendezvous here. But unless I'm missing something... We just go to the same place every time. Like their favorite place. It, it almost feels like there was a feature where you had to s try and think like, oh, who would like to come here? Oh, she loves being served. Take her to, like if you take her to the park, she's probably like, what are we doing here? This is ridiculous, you know? But I don't see an option to change that. So, unfinished feature maybe. Unless, I, unless I've missed something. But it's like when it comes in, it doesn't. There's no option for where to take them. Ba -bum -bum. Oh no, there it is. I just pick an open spot. Right, cool. Okay, that's. <laughs> right. So if I wanted to see Honorade on that day, pick location. But I already know that she likes there. I'm going to take her um, to here. Biting my tongue. Biting my tongue. Okay. Drinking, dancing, and cabaret. I... Right. Didn't even... I clicked the wrong button. Okay. Right. Cool. Alright. Cool. Lovely. Uh, we're going to rest today. Three fatigue. Nine hours in works out how to take people on dates. Fluffing heck, dude. <sighs> I don't care. Decline. Okay. Elizabeth! Bum, bum, bum. Alex, go away. That's definitely a bug, because he's dead. Antoine. Okay. I'm going to book Honorade here. Oh! Oh, because they already have... Right, okay. If you already have one with them, then you can't get any more. Da -da 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 -da. It takes a little longer than before to get to Elizabeth's studio today. This nice special event. The streets are simply crowded with throngs of people going about their daily business. Mm -hmm. Great to see you, Elizabeth says as she strides into the room, already dressed to paint. Should we get started? I'm itching to work. With what has become practiced ease, you disrobe and take your position on the satin couch. Elizabeth takes the cover off of your portrait and prepares her paints. At this stage, she's focused on specific details of your portrait. Occasionally, she asks for you to minutely shift parts of your body this way and that. I wasn't sure you'd even agree to pose for me. Nudes tend to make clients nervous. Don't worry, I would have suggested a nude, even if you didn't. As long as you don't go parading this in public. Hmm. Elizabeth doesn't say anything for a while, but shifts uncomfortably at her easel. Elizabeth? Of course not. This is just for me. And you. Elizabeth returns to her painting, glancing up at you at regular intervals before squinting down at a particular detail. An hour passes. You take a break to stand up and stretch. Even with your relaxed pose on the couch, all that time spent staying exactly still starts to wear on you. You return back to your position and Elizabeth to her art. You find yourself shifting on the couch again. It's been quite a long session. Elizabeth, what's going on? What? Elizabeth asks, standing up from her canvas. Huh. Sorry, I'm, I must have finished up half an hour ago, she says with a sly grin. I just enjoy looking at you like this. She gets up from her easel and walks over to you. You must be very cold. Her finger traces down the outside of your thigh. How would you like to warm up? 
I'd love some tea, please. Missing the point entirely. Shut up and kiss me. <laughs> well, the client is always right, she replies with a smirk. With the rustling sound of skirts, Elizabeth kneels on the couch and places a hand on the armrest behind you. Gently, she leans over you. You crane your neck until your lips meet. You have to admit, she is very warm. You earned a large amount of favour with Elizabeth, but you probably already knew that, didn't you? <laughs> Sometime later, after taking time to fix your hair and slip back into your foundation garments, you're taking tea and pastries with Elizabeth. I think we did more than kiss. They taste amazing, but they might just be because you're famished. Oh, I almost forgot, Elizabeth giggles. I should probably show you the painting you've been sitting for all this time. With a burst of fresh energy, she gets up and walks over to the easel. She turns around the canvas and you see yourself. Well, not just yourself. It's Elizabeth's version of you. And while she isn't in the portrait, you can see so much of her personality in the painting. You look relaxed and confident, but adorned with an enigmatic smile and eyes that seem to be looking somewhere else. It's obvious a tremendous amount of work has gone into this painting. If you squint closely, you can see places where oil paints have been layered and layered, the result of endless attempts to get some tiny detail just right. It's a labor of love, and it shows. Elizabeth takes a deep breath, her next words are almost a sigh of relief. I'm really proud of this one. I can't wait to get it framed and hung up in my collection. The two of you lounge and chat about the painting for some time. You pace about the studio while you talk, relishing the chance to stretch your limbs after all this time. Eventually it gets late enough that the two of you have to say your goodbyes. Elizabeth helps you back into your dress. You walk home. Compared to the nightmarish hustle and bustle of before, the streets feel almost abandoned. You stroll alone, lost in your own thoughts. You arrive home, unsure of how you feel. Elizabeth is extremely useful. That was lovely. Nobody made me feel the way Elizabeth does. This might have been a mistake. It was lovely. Feeling buoyed by the heady thrills of love, you ascend to your bedroom on light feet and prepare yourself for bed. Smoochy smoochy. Jew, I'm broke. Mm, 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 mm. The horses, yeah. I wonder if that's bugged. See if it fixes. Wait. Did I miss... Did I miss a... date with Honorade because I went to that? <gasps> Did I stand her up? If you set the date, do you have to go to it yourself? Uh... Oh god. Well. I'm going to take her to this... This place is rustic, right? What's this place? Always lively, never boring, coarse and proletarian. Let's take her there. Oops. Unlock the cafe. My name is Marguerite. Let me be the first to welcome you to Cafe Prince. What can I get you? Just water. House coffee. Huh. Certainly. She gives a quick curtsy before she checks in with another table, taking their order as well. You sigh and take in the cafe around you. The whole place hums with excitement as patrons make new pronouncements and trade verbal barbs with their compatriots. She returns with your coffee, steaming hot. The porcelain cup clinks lightly as she sets it down. Enjoy, madame. Okay. Coffee can reduce exhaustion. Oh. After a few minutes, it becomes obvious the revolution is significantly more powerful than the crown. It might be possible for the crown to resist the revolution's demands. They would have to build strong alliances. Opening your eyes, you switch your focus to something more important. Wait, so I can come here and understand what's going on in the world? Mate, I feel like this stuff should have been explained to me. Uh, 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 uh. The church is right. Send whoever they think for the task. The crown is right. The French should decide the fate of France. Mate, 
I don't know, I'm just here to drink coffee. Ba -dum -bum -bum. A date. Right, those horses won't shut up, so let me load my game. Again. <laughs> They're even on the main menu! Right, okie doke. Start the whole bloody thing again. Great, wonderful, lovely, brilliant, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Da -da 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 -da. I feel like at this point we're just here for the uh, <laughs> the silly filth and seeing if I end up on the guillotine or not. Like, yes, 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 bloody politics, all right, settle down. Come on, what are you going to do with me, eh? Okay, so today is a date. Awaiting response. So I sent her a letter and I'm waiting for her to reply to me. So maybe that's what happened. Has she said no? Just as a waiting response. Maybe I haven't done it in like far enough in advance. Weird. <laughs> what do we have? Elizabeth and Ludovico. Hire Hansel. Should we finally get our bodyguard? I need some money, actually. I don't have any money to hire him with. Better sell this gossip. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be out on the streets. Pause to read the social pages of the newspaper while you take your breakfast. Sitting at your vanity, one of the benefits of working for Pierre is getting a free newspaper. You nearly spit said breakfast all over the mirror. Reading the social pages more closely, paying attention to key details, stories you wrote could be traced to you. Peril. That's what you get for selling, I guess. So yeah, look. It just went declined. What's the point if she's not gonna... I don't understand. Honorade, please. Journalism. A study in chemistry. La Place Royale. The coffee shop. Rest at home. Then we don't need rest. Truly well rested. Oh my god. A bonus that we've never seen before. Five credibility bonus at next party. It's no small secret that the hunger of the countryside has reached Paris. The king, in an attempt to provide some relief to the citizens of the city, ordered the Point Neuf closed down in a place to distribute bread set up as a public relief effort. The bridge was, of course, immediately flooded with people. The bread wagons ran out of bread on the first day. The lines were plagued with frauds trying to cheat relief workers into giving them multiple loaves. Enraged, the crowds quickly overwhelmed the meager guards set to keep order and threw the empty bread carts into the river. Many went to sleep with bellies empty of food but hearts stuffed with resentment. Revolution is coming. This is a date with Elizabeth. Like here, two musics are playing together as well. I've noticed that when we've come here. Okay, nothing new. Ba -bum -bum -bum. I guess I'll just wait for Honorade to invite me somewhere. Da -da. Nothing. She's a lady of leisure, resting all the time. That's a party. I guess bourgeois party. Could see her there. Maybe she's upset with us. 
This is a revolutionary party. Wah, 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 wah. Oh, it's a date with Antoine. <laughs> Mubby. Nothing new. A date with Elizabeth. No, Alex. No. Honorade. What if I invite Antoine to the same place Alex took us? I want to see what he would make of that. We'll see if he responds. No, 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 no. Mm. Time forward. Huh. The rent. Huh. I made some pretty good money. Ah, there you go. So that's how what happens if someone accepts. So Honorade probably just doesn't like being invited on dates because she wants to be in control, right? Antoine's fair game. Just these same rotating missions. So now... Following the events at Revelion's factory, a general air of tension feels like it has blanketed all of Paris. Rumors of imagined violence swell at every turn, threatening to incite real violence. This reached a new peak yesterday when several members of the nobility in the city woke up to find the letter P painted in black on their front doors. It's believed the letter stood for prescribed, make, marking the occupants for death to a group of assassins. Whoever said assassins never materialized, it didn't take long for the Gwet Royal to track down the vandals responsible and extract some confessions. These empty threats from dissidents have only served to make the aristocracy seem more powerful and untouchable. Okay, so our first date that's not in the same place. See how it changes. Antoine, tumultuous as ever, storms over to you. So you've... Uh, mm, ha, well, that's the voice. You've made it, shall we? <laughs> you look ravishing. He looks around. You're not really certain if he's examining the location or looking for threats. <laughs> ah, common people, rustic setting, enjoying themselves in a truly honest way. It reminds me of home. Anton finds a table for the two of you near the stage. You share a bottle of wine. Together you sing along with the music, and for a brief moment, Anton almost looks relaxed. Almost. A few hours later, you realize it's getting late. I mean, I don't think we missed much by not doing those. Let's be honest. <laughs> There's probably something I'm totally missing that like fic like continues the game. I'll still be here in three weeks. Well, hour thirty. Still, still don't know what I'm doing. Well, okie dokie. Do this one. Looking around, you spot Elizabeth standing there with her sketchbook. She appears to be studying sculptures, never bothering to look down at her page while her hands work continuously. Her face looks slack, almost bored. She glances over to you and her expression brightens up. Bonjour. What are you doing here? Hmm. Nothing important. Have you been drawing the church? Huh. Wee oui, wee, oui, she replies, tapping her pencil against her lips. I just learned that one of my potential clients is extremely devout. I thought it would make sense to take some inspiration from religious sculptures for her portrait. What's up, Joan? Welcome back. Even if she doesn't completely understand all my choices, I think it will leave a good impression on her when I show her the final product. Whenever that is. This church isn't that popular, but it's my favourite in the city. Overall, it feels like the right balance of decoration. Beautiful, detail, without having so much stuff. <sighs> If there's too much going on, all the details become pointless. Just as she says that, you notice Ludovico stepping out of the church, talking attentively with an older woman, helping her down the church's precarious stone steps. Upon closer examination, this woman might be the most ancient human being you've ever seen in your entire life. He glances up to you and waves. Watching the glacial pace of their progress, you start to wonder if they'll be finished before she has to return to morning mass the next day. Ludovico keeps looking at you plaintively while trying to gently hurry along the proceedings. Finally, Ludovico finishes with his duties and approaches the two of you. Ah, bonjour, no. 
Bonjour, Father, Elizabeth replies, a little uncertain of what to make of the priest that has approached the two of you with such familiarity. I'm sorry for not coming over soon, Yvette. I had a parishioner who wanted to ask her some questions on a matter of faith. That quickly proved to not be the case. She was just lonely, looking for someone to talk to. Oh, I know I'm not supposed to encourage such things, but she needed someone to talk to, and it felt like the right thing to do. Also, those steps are dreadfully unsafe. Hmm. Oh, who is your friend here? Ludovico asks, looking over Elizabeth before he suddenly leans back in shock. Madre de Dio, are you Madame Labrou? I saw one of your self-portraits in a salon the last week. Hmm. Really, you enjoy my work, Elizabeth replies, eyeing him suspiciously. My paintings have been decried as vain, scandalous, and self-serving. Vain? Scandalous? I never saw such a thing in your work. Just gorgeous paintings of a person. As we thought, all humanity is a God's creation. Which means that to exalt his creation is to exalt him as well. I went a bit, I went a little sharp on that. Hello. Is either that all of those nude statues we keep in the Vatican are really sending the wrong message? Turning their attention back to you, their conversation falls into an awkward silence as neither of them really want to make the first move. It looks like you have to make the decision for them. What's this sudden tension? Come now, you both have so much in common. Elizabeth, can I join you while you work? Ludovico, are you free right now or do you have more old ladies to converse with? I think it would be very rude to uh, not choose Elizabeth at this juncture after we, after we just, uh, you know. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. In fact, I could use a break. You'd be perfect for this. It's a game some of my friends and I play where we take three minutes and we both try and draw each other at the same time. It never fails to make me laugh and it would be good to focus on something new. Yeah, just make me about your work constantly, Elizabeth. It makes me feel really important and special. It's fine. Hmm. Well, uh, I have uh, some affairs I should attend to myself. Uh, hopefully see you later. But With a quick nod, Ludovico leaves and heads off down the street. You sit down with Elizabeth and try your hand at this drawing game, she suggested. While you're not exactly a trained artist, this isn't your first time trying to doodle a picture of someone. It is, however, the first time you've tried it with someone who is moving around so much. Eventually, you trade... You trade you outrageously bizarre finished portraits as keepsakes at the moment. Ludovico's villain origin. I know, I'm just expecting when we're leading the revolution into the town, we find, like, Ludovico standing there with two swords, like, ready to take his revenge. Eventually, your time together comes to an end and you need to head home. All things considered, it feels like a successful day. Into July. For how many times he was scorned! Crown party. Bless him. Sweet boy. Sweet soft priest. Oh wait, it's a date. <laughs> but still nothing new. Maybe, maybe, like... Maybe that sitting with her is the end of it. You know? The fact that we, you know, did the deed. Maybe that's it. The end. The end of romance. The end of love. But, um, bomb. I haven't played a visual novel in so long. I think if I just played one that did just focus on love and choices, I would probably really get into it. Because that's what I, like, I just wish that it, this had focused on that. Because the writing's really good. And if it had just focused on dates and the romance side, I think this second chapter would have held up. First chapter was amazing. I just think it's not kind of fitting very well together in this second chapter, unfortunately. First chapter was really good, that's all. Um, something's not quite working in this second one for me. But it's still good, it's just the first one was, like, felt very polished. Um. Because with it repeating the dates and stuff, you don't feel, like, I feel like the point of those visual novels is feeling the advancement, right? Like, you're trying to impress them and then, oh, now I feel like we're... You know, even giving somebody gifts in Stardew, it's that goal of unlocking the next cutscene, the next, oh, I got more hearts with them, blah, 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 blah. So, I'm, like, not feeling that here. So now I've reached a point where I'm like, what am I doing, you know? 
Nam Sayan. Nam Sayan. Need to do Dream Daddy. Yeah, it's on the list as soon as I get some time with all these new games coming out. Is that one a lot more romantic? Looking around, you see Honorade arrived long before you. So this is the same. <laughs> Nothing. Come on, Gazelle, give us something. And the fact that Alex is bugged. <laughs> Another Elizabeth date. Honorade date. We're going in circles now. Like, no... The plot line isn't advancing itself. Current objective is nothing. Maybe I should try going somewhere else. Go get some coffee. Huh. <sighs> Have a coffee. Something here, maybe. Your journal's updated with the standings of all political factions. The revolution is significantly more powerful than the crown. Good. That's what we want. We just need to know how to get to the ending now. The military is the most powerful of the minor factions. A disheveled woman is banging her fists on the table, claiming officials who pay the army's wages on time are thieves. I support the bourgeoisie. Huh. Rent. Uh -huh. Revolution party. Yeah, I guess. May as well. <laughs> Rumors in the city. Chemistry. Perils of journalism. Something with Elizabeth. Let's follow up with Elizabeth. Since we seem to be unlocking stuff with her. Hmm. No, monsieur, this isn't a joke. I'm willing to pay a very reasonable price for it. And oh, she yelps as the door slams shut on her foot. Ow. Leaping back as she recoils with pain. Before she can put herself back in harm's way, the door shuts with a bang. Who is this man? And how would you like me to burn his house down? Mm -hmm. No, it's fine, she says, rubbing her foot. Years and years ago, when I was getting started as an artist, I was caught painting portraits without a license. Yes, that's illegal. Don't laugh. Not only did I have to pay mountains of fines that I could barely afford, the black mark on my reputation nearly cost me my career before it started. However, all my old paintings are still circulating, and the fact that they're still out there doesn't look good for me. I'm trying to buy them back. Huh. As you can see, she says, pointing to the door, some of my old customers aren't exactly fond of the idea. You look at the door and wonder if there's anything you can do to help. Um, credibility or peril? We'll go peril. You in there? You sure you want to be so violent to the Queen's personal painter? Carefully placing your ear to the door, you hear frantic scrambling on the other side of the door before it opens and someone steps outside. Oh. Did you have to be so loud? He hisses at you frantically. Some of us have reputations to uphold, you know? Yes, I'm one of those people, Elizabeth hisses back. Let me buy my painting. Oh. But I like the portrait. My wife commissioned it for my birthday. Well, oh. What if I painted you a new one instead? Only if you still pay for the old one. Fine. The two of them spend the better part of the next ten minutes sorting specific details. Ah. Thank you, Ovet. I'm amazed that you managed to get him to see sense. This is going to make things a lot easier. Bum, 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 bum. You awake to find a letter already on your bedside table. Finally, when you open the letter and see the handwriting, your suspicions are confirmed. A message from Armand. I write to you now to explain the situation has become extremely grave. Our Habsburgian society was founded with the intent of achieving great social change over the course of many years. These latest violent upheavals have shown us that our time is dwindling faster than we ever could have imagined. Our mission cannot be accomplished. I know Ioana won't like it, but I need to try to push for something more achievable in our dwindling hours. I'll have to do it behind her back, but I accept the consequences for that. It may be her society, but the mission belongs to us all. To be honest, Joanna worries me right now. She's growing more distant and agitated by the day. I know our circumstances are taxing, but something doesn't feel right about her. Stay safe. Love, Armand. May you stay safe as well. While you contemplate to do with the rest of your day, you keep wondering what exactly Armand has in mind. Wah, 
I guess we'll unlock this, see if there's anything here. A massive garden dotted with all sorts of fantastic buildings, small Egyptian pyramids, Roman columns, Turkish tents, and more, all cluster around a sparkling lake. People in costumes strut about the different buildings, enthralling tourists with fantastic tales of dubious authenticity. It looks like everyone's having fun. This must be the Parc Monaco, created by the fabulously wealthy Duke of Chartres. Taking note of your surroundings, you jot the location down. It's fun and tacky, and the kind of place to take someone that's adventurous, but doesn't take themselves too seriously. Hmm. Honorate, then? Ridiculous, can't wait to come back. After a quick loop around the gardens, you head home. Blip. Party time with the crown. I think one of my dresses has disappeared. Mm -mm. Do any of these look like they might be something? <gasps> Honorade, favor. You notice two women, apart from everyone else in the room, laughing in a guilty yet carefree way that suggests something is afoot. They've yet to notice you, yet you're drawn to them like a banker towards an outstanding debt. Mm -hmm. I've heard the most outlandish things from my fellow business partners. Partners. <laughs> I was reading chat at the same time where you said painters, and I went... <laughs> partners in the bourgeoisie, but I just know it'll come back to haunt me if I repeat it here. Maybe we did leave it at the painters. Rushed home, naked in a carriage. What a familiar feeling. My husband told me of what he'd seen in the army, and I'm of the same mind. Given the reprisals you've endured since you started to work with Pierre, you understand. It's not something anyone would want to be on the receiving end of. The two women stare at each other. <laughs> Neither of us have to discuss what we know with anyone. Get information on the bourgeoisie. Do I know you? She asks as you approach her, desperately trying to maintain a stony, determined expression. <laughs> Outrageous gossip. I lost favor with Honorade, but how does she know I'm not getting the gossip to take care of her? You don't know? Nothing. Rendezvous with Elizabeth. Would it be really rude to go wearing Honorade's outfit that she got me? Probably, right? <laughs> How could you? Mm -mm. The front page story concerned with a man who's been sentenced to death for treason. He was a member of a nefarious organization conspiring against the king. Whoever the man is, you can't help but feel pity for him. You heard grumbling on the streets that judges are becoming heavy-handed with their charges and sentencing, hoping to keep order by making an example of few criminals. You almost skip the article until you spot a name. It can't be. The now disgraced Baron Armand de Marbo will be executed via beheading in three days' time for high treason. Your blood runs cold as you read these words over and over. How? How would this have happened? You'd only just managed to find Armand and now he's going to be executed? How did he get caught? Did one of the Habsburgians sell him out? What happened? You frantically search through the article for any clue as to where he's being held. He's being held in the Gwet Royal watch station in the middle of the city. This is goodbye. If you hurry, you might be able to visit him one last time. Oh my days. Action! Action, finally. But first, a date with my mistress, yes? <laughs> Great. Love that. What a, what a wonderful use of my clicking finger. This is it. 
totally turned in by Joanna, by the way, calling that. Walking to the watch post, you expect to feel a swell of emotions, but you mostly just feel none. You were always certain you'd be able to find Armand eventually, you just never expected it to be like this. Rounding a corner, you see the watch post, and the squat building feels massive and imposing. In an open square nearby, you see the wooden frame of the gallows, but that's for common criminals. Armand is a nobleman. He will die by executioner's sword, as is tradition. You approach a guard who eyes you suspiciously and barely moves from his post at the door. What's your business here, madam? He asks, his voice flat and monotone. I'm here to see the traitor. I should be allowed parting words. Hmm. He cocks a single eyebrow while you hold up your hand to show your engagement ring as you say this. He stares at you in silence for a few moments, as if this might let him divine your true intentions. You prove yourself inscrutable to him, so he stops. This way, madam, he replies, waving for another watchman to take his post. Inside, the holding cells are quiet, dark, abominably dismal. You've read of prisons being raucous places, perpetually alive with the din of prisoners banging cups against bars and howling their innocence to anyone who would hear them. Not here. It's as silent as a cemetery. If you strain your ears, you can just make out the creaking of wood as prisoners watch you through gratings in cell doors. Nobody says a word as you're led to Armand's cell. The traitor's in here, the Gwet Royal says, pointing to an unmarked cell door. You'll be allowed to speak with him for a few minutes. You will then be escorted out. You will not be allowed to give him anything. You will not be allowed to take anything from him. Have I made myself clear? Oi. Huh. The guard lets you into the cell before locking the door behind you. Inside, you find Armand. He has a few bruises on him. His complexion is one and unhealthy. This is the man you came to Paris for all those months ago. Feels like it's been a lifetime. Totally discounting the fact that we've found him multiple times and hugged him and kissed him and stuff since then. Yvette? Cherie, he croaks, his voice tired and strained. Armand, what are you doing here? What happened? <laughs> as inquisitive as ever, he replies with a weak smile. This society I joined, it's led by a woman named Joanna de Jardin. I met her for the first time when I moved to Paris, and I quickly became her closest confidant as we worked to accomplish a hidden agenda. He stares at the heavens and sighs. I was blind to it. But during our time working together on this secret project, Joanna had come to desire me romantically. I never felt the same way. She became embittered. Recently, she must have reported me to the authorities as an act of revenge. He shakes his head violently. If none of that matters now. What does matter is you're in danger. Joanna de Jardin, the woman who reported me to the Wet Royal, is not what she appears to be. He steps close to you. Joanna de Jardin's real name is Johanna von Halbein. I saw it in the document she left out at once. She doesn't yet know that I've learned this about her. As he explains this, he pulls a letter from the boot and slips it to you, written in German. But you see the name Johanna von Holbein signed at the bottom of it. You secret the letter under your stays. I researched the name a little of my own. To my knowledge, it appears that the von Holbeins are an Austrian noble family. Specifically, they're one in deep decline. It might explain why she started the Frankish Habsburgian society. She hopes it could reverse her family's fortunes. Regardless, I believed in the righteousness of our cause, so I didn't remark on it to her. Still, it's likely that what has kept her so focused, her family's return to prominence. You think about Joanna's signet ring, which you've... Rick you think about Joanna's signet ring, which you found in the house, hidden beneath the floorboards. The mysterious sigil the mysterious sigil on it is likely her family's crest. She herself said that she wanted Armand to have it because it would be enough to convince people to I was supposed to record the podcast tonight. I don't think that's happening. I'm just like <laughs> Oh God. Have it because that would be enough to convince people to help Armand cross the border. That means her family must be relatively well known. I tell you this because I'm worried she might not be satisfied with my execution. She's an unbelievably driven woman. I think you may be the next target of her vengeance. If that occurs, you should be prepared. I don't know how you can use it, but knowing Ioana's real identity has the key to preventing her from finishing whatever design she may have upon you. He suddenly stops, steps back, and watches you as if seeing you for the first time. Sorry, I just wanted to take a moment to remember this. You're actually here. You start at the sound of a sudden knocking on the cell door. Time's up. He breathes deep and forces a smile. I guess this is goodbye. Kiss him. You leap towards him and he envelops you in his arms. It's a quick kiss, but one done with the hope of lasting forever. One that hopes to delay the inevitable. You're interrupted by the sound of the door opening. 
With a grunt, the guard enters the cell and wordlessly motions for you to leave. Before you can say anything else, he ushers you out of the watch post into the street before returning to his duties. Thrust back into the sunlight, you shield your eyes from the glare and stare at the world. You stare at the people going about daily lives completely unaffected by everything that you've just learned. It takes a concerted effort to decide exactly how you feel. You're one of von Harbein. It looks like I have some work to do. You shut your eyes and take a deep breath to gather your thoughts and steady your nerves. You cannot allow yourself to panic, not now, so much is at stake. You walk home at brisk pace, but in your mind already at work, planning, calculating. Johanna. The day has opened with staggering news. The king has dismissed Monsieur Jacques Necker who was both the Prime Minister and the Controller General of Finances. Monsieur Necker's reputation as a friend of the people was so great that he was welcomed into office with a fireworks display. While it's understood that he was always a controversial figure, his competence has never been in question. He argued for the abolition of serfdom and once broke a policy stalemate by leaking the national budget to the press. <sighs> bothered. Bothered, bothered, bothered. Listen, I have a painter to kiss, okay? When is his execution? Let's get to that. Rent. Do we get to go to the execution? It said three days, right? Prime Minister was dismissed. I feel like my game's broken. If that wasn't disturbing enough, it's well known at this point the militia will have no shortage of volunteers. Uh, small military checkpoint, only large concentration of weaponry. Utterly insane, nobody will try to storm a castle in the middle of Paris. The situation is dire. Go to the party. Why am I... There's no... Is there no scene for... Armand getting killed? I don't understand. Surely that should be an event. Right? Anyone here? No one. No Anton, no nothing. I literally want to start like a new playthrough and click through it like on my own sometime and see if it works properly. I'm s confused, man. There should be a sad scene of him being executed, at least some artwork. Right? Ba 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 ba. There's Antoine. He gently takes you by the elbow and leads you to a corner of the room. Not grabbing me this time. Learned his lesson. Hey, something dire has happened. Something I need you to do. Tell me. I'll handle it. Hmm. Fantastique. Do you remember those posters? We may have gotten away unscathed. It appears the printmaker who made the posters wasn't so lucky. One of his apprentices betrayed him to the archers and now our friend is imprisoned. Awaiting a very one-sided trial. Normally I'd do something myself, but I have reason to believe the archers have been told to keep an eye on me. He continues, eyeing certain guests at the party suspiciously and also narrating in the same voice. This man, Monsieur Clet, has taken risks for us. We must repay the favour. For liberty. <laughs> it used to be a fortress. I'm So, wait, we're discussing breaking someone who printed posters for us out of prison, but I didn't seek anyone to do that for my fiancé. <laughs> okay. Sure. He bends low and kisses the back of your hand. Sorry, I should step away before anyone gets suspicious. We have to keep it a secret. Right, we've definitely gone three days. Is this it? The Bastille, a looming castle, that was once the most infamous prison in all of Paris. It barely fills its role as a prison anymore. A mob of over a thousand commoners armed with pikes, kitchen implements, and stolen rifles attempted to storm the fortress. The guards number barely more than a hundred. No, it's not the execution. 
Just a scuffle. Chapter three. The. F <laughs> the last two weeks have been complete chaos. There's been fighting in the streets. Roads and alleys are blocked with barricades. The roaring drone of chanted revolutionary slogans merged with orders to disperse, punctuated by screams of gunfire. In the past, you heard so much about glory, glorious uprisings from one group, and the valor and loyalty unto deaths from the other. But hiding in your house for the last few days, you've yet to see any of that. As you can imagine, this has put a rather serious dampener on your social calendar. You can no longer receive random party invitations. While the violence stretches on into its own terrifying monotony, you can't help but feel it's building towards something, like all this conflict will finally come to a head. As you consider leaving your house for the first time in weeks, you imagine that the next few days would be a good time to get your affairs in order. To that point, you consider Pierre's humble newspaper. Ah, date with a ghost. No, thank you. Date with Honorade, yes, please. Need more of that, honestly. Just give me Honorade, patting me on the head. That's all I need. That's all you need to get some good review points. <gasps> da 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 da! At Antoine's request, you travel to the infamous Chateau to get the printmaker out. Right. I mean, I guess, so. It's a long walk. Dabbing a few droplets of sweat from your brow, you curse the heat and the almost suspiciously sunny weather. You consider putting up your hood, but decide it would make you stand out too much. Go to the nunnery. You go around the right side and examine the nunnery, peaceful and clean, but sparse in terms of any ornamentation. You spot a small group of nuns walking and talking together, but they keep their distance from you. You giggle at the memory of all the times your angry parents threatened to send you to a nunnery for some mischief you'd wrought in town. Looking around, you can't help but wonder how many women here are actually here because they want to be here, and how many were enrolled by force. A woman who spent her life devoted to the Lord, another one put there by her fed-up family. Surely God would know the difference between the two. You snap out of your religious pontification to search the area for something useful. Going around a corner, you notice an unattended washing line with a few nun habits that have just finished drying. Yoink. You look around and grab the garments and quickly put one over on your regular clothes. Once you finish donning the heavy and stifling outfit, you find yourself cursing the fates that led to you doing this. With your disguise complete, you flee the scene. You head to the prison and try your luck there. The gate is protected by a single guard fiddling with his pipe and tobacco. He looks up at you and politely averts his eyes. Sister, what are you doing here? I'm here to administer to the souls of the condemned. You're here to... Of course, sister, he exclaims, fumbling for the keys and lets you in. God be with you. You breathe. <laughs> oh, my fiancé was in here before they cut off his head and I didn't even go to the execution. Oh, well. You breathe deeply as you step inside, savouring the cool air of the stone building. Unfortunately, it smells like stagnant water, musty old hay and desperation. Spotting no other guards in the area, you start searching the cells for a man matching the description. Hmm. What are you doing here? Antoine sent me. The revolution doesn't abandon its own. Are you serious, he asks, some of his vigour returning to him in a wave of excitement. Anyway, I could count on you. With his disguise ready, you lead him out of the cell and fall into steps behind you, staring at the ground with something that resembles a pious look of contemplation. You realise Monsieur Clet makes for a particularly unusual-looking nun, but hopefully it's still within the realm of believability. You head outside and have to pause for a moment, as you're nearly blinded by the bright light of the midday sun. For some reason, he decides against it. He sits back down and continues to smoke his pipe. Together, you and Monsieur Clet walk all the way back to Paris. Ooh. The taste of the open air has never been so good. Thank you so much, madam. I still can't believe my good fortune. I should find somewhere to lay low for a while. Good idea. I'm going home. To Au? 1789. I just want to see if the dates are different in Chapter 3. Will we ever find out what Honorade's contraption was? At first I was like, please no, but now I'm kind of like, that would bring some life back to this. <laughs> you wake up and stretch, feeling a twinge in your back as you curse whatever contorted position you managed to fall asleep in last night. Judging from the noise outside, Paris has yet to become any more peaceful during your night's rest. Just as you wonder what Camille has prepared for breakfast, you notice the faint smell of perfume, floral, bitter. There's a letter on the bedside table. Judging from the rich purple of the wax seal, as well as the scent of the perfume, it was sent by Madame Gazelle. You open it and begin to read the letter. The flowing cursive of her handwriting is beautiful and familiar. Cher Yvette, 
As of late, I've been feeling even better than I did at the beginning of our last fateful encounter. My gardens are doing well, and I'd love for you to see them. Here, there will be no chance of us being interrupted. I await your arrival. Bien, apparemment. Bien, baguette. Fanning yourself with the letter to drive away some of the summer heat, you can't help but notice the smell of her perfume on the letter again. You idly realize you could go there tonight if you were willing to brave the streets of Paris. Wah, 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 wah. Madame Gazelle has invited you to visit her at home. A rare and enticing opportunity. The city may be in tumult, but that makes her command no easier to disobey. Finally. Some spice up in here. Hastily walking to Madame Gazelle's house with your hood up, you realize you've never actually been there before. Thankfully, you've memorized her address from all the letters she sent you. Of course, even if you didn't know the address already, you'd certainly be able to recognize the place. An elaborate, fashionable Rococo pop building sits back at the street and behind a gate. The windows are shrouded by black... We've, we've been here before. What do you mean? Read this exact line. You go to knock on the gate, but it opens before you can touch it. Looking around, expecting some sort of spectre or sorcery at play, you instead notice Madame Gazelle's servant, René. You're especially surprised to notice that he's no longer wearing his black armband. We're out of mourning. With a thin smile, the ever-silent René waves you in and leads you beyond the gate and into the house, which looks exactly the same as that other guy's house. The sushi. No tour of the house is provided, but you stroll through the dining room and the salon towards the garden in the back. You're offered a glass of wine from an impressively dusty bottle, which you take. It's simply nice to be prepared. You arrive in the gardens, which are filled with a combination of blooming roses and lilies. The scent is almost overwhelming. Renée indicates to Madame Gazelle, who is waiting on a chaise longue at the centre of the garden. A table is set up next to her, draped in a black sheet. She hasn't noticed you. He bows and begins to dismiss himself. Say thank you, enter the garden. Actually, Renée, I need you to help me with something special. I want to know what that is. His eyes widen. You produce the black satin outfit that Madame Gazelle gave you so long ago. Renée smiles broadly, genuinely. You step back inside for a few minutes, and while his help isn't as quick as Camille's, he helps you in. Back in the garden, she's waiting on her chaise longue, reading by a lantern amongst the flowers. A single spot of sumptuous darkness in a halo of light. Your queen! You step out of the darkness, suddenly appearing before her, dressed in the vision that she imagined for you. <laughs> for once in all the time you've known her, you have truly caught her off guard. Her eyes drink you in deeply, hungrily, as she stalks towards you. You, my darling, Yvette, are a vision. That you would even think to, she trails off, holding the edge of your midnight-coloured skirt between thumb and forefinger. Marvelous. Marvelous de mousse. The timing is impeccable as always. I have a very important meeting tomorrow, which will consume a lot of time in the near future. But let's focus on tonight. She purrs, tracing a finger across the table concealed by a sheet. After all, I finally have you all to myself. I have to ask what brought you here, why I come at all. I want you and I get what I want. You asked me to, I can't resist your commands. What's the meeting about? Um, I don't want to acquiesce too easily. Right as you start to speak, she shushes you. Wait, wait, wait. Reaching past you, she plucks a lily from the garden and places it in your hair. Much better, she says with a devilish grin. Now you may speak, my sweet Yvette. Ah. Somewhat flustered, you start again on how you came here for love, but it feels so unnecessary right after she'd started arranging flowers in your hair. Still, you can tell that she appreciates the effort. She pulls you closer and your hands are on each other's bodies. None of your movements feel like your own. Instead, you feel like she's guiding you this way and that. You close your eyes as your lips meet. As your eyes open, you see Madame Gazelle pulling the black sheet from the table, revealing a series of items. <coughs> your eyes mostly focus on the lengths of sturdy black ribbon and the riding crop. Glancing around, you also realize that no windows from any of the neighbor's buildings face this garden. Yvette, I'll say this plainly. I trust you. How much do you trust me? 
I trust you more than I trust myself. <laughs> ah, I'm very glad to hear that, she says in a low growl, taking your chin between her thumb and forefinger. Don't worry. I'll never ask you to do anything you don't want to. However, you may find yourself wanting to do things that you never expected. She seizes you and pushes you down face first onto the chaise longue. You hear the creak of tightening leather as she clenches the riding crop in her hand. It's a confusing night, but it feels good. Impossibly so, like you're deceiving the entire world to do it. In fact, the two of you are so caught up in your play together that you don't even leave the garden. Hours later, you're exhausted, sore, and consumed by heady bliss. Naked, the two of you fall asleep on the chaise long together, using only each other's body heat to keep warm. You wake up in the middle of the night. Madame Gazelle is asleep next to you, snoring slightly. Stay with her or explore the house. Oh my gosh. Filth. <laughs> Saucy. Um. I don't want to, like, disrespect and explore the house, right? We've just been invited here. We don't want to screw it up. <sighs> Tough choice, eh? Also, we earned that moment. Bloody played for nine hours. With a quiet yawn, you lay back down and snuggle up to Madame Gazelle again. Without even waking up, her arms slip around you, protectively, possessively. Once again, you fall fast asleep, warmed only by the body of another. Awoken by the chill of an early morning breeze, you find yourself still on the same chaise long together. This time, you're alone, but covered with a light blanket. It's black, just like everything else she owns. Looking up at the sound of approaching footsteps, you find Rene studiously averting his eyes as he brings you a nice breakfast on a silver tray. Bundling yourself up in the sheet, you take the tray from him and begin your breakfast. The good food is made better by the fact that you're extremely hungry, a note on the tray, hastily written but still smelling of Madame Gazelle's perfume. You open it. My darling Yvette, I'm sorry I'm gone. I had to leave for an important meeting. Sometimes business truly does come before pleasure. I wanted to say last night was amazing, and I look forward to playing with you again. To be honest, I never thought I'd be able to trust someone again the way that I now trust you. Love, Madame Gazelle. Renee departs and you take time to savour the breakfast before you get dressed and head home. It's still so early that only people on the streets are the ones that fell asleep there last night. It's you and your thoughts and some truly interesting memories. That was everything I wanted and more. <laughs> I'm bloody sore bottom, but that was great. Um, I should have taken the time to explore that house while I had the chance. I mean, I'm regretting. I'm just trying to be respectful of, like, a character that we actually care about. But, uh, everything I wanted. You head st your head's still lost in the bliss of last night. You stumble home with the grace of a tipsy dancer. Every movement joyous, every thought elsewhere. You never imagined your life would lead you here. But you're glad that it has. You wake up to find a letter. Anton's furious handwriting. Something momentous has come to pass. I can't think of anyone I'd rather celebrate it with than you. Join me for a dinner. <laughs> oh no. It's everyone's like final dates. <sighs> God. God damn it. And this is a standard date with Honorade. I wonder if this will be affected at all by what just happened. Nope. Dun, 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 dun. The newspaper. Trying to suppress political organizations or clubs. Stop at the name buried in the middle of the article. The Frankish Habsburgian Society. The society is the same one Armand was a member of before he was captured and executed. Sends a wretched shiver up your spine to see printed a newspaper for the whole world to see. The archers state that they have not found the leader of the society yet, urging the public to come forward. I guess we could, like, totally grass up Joanna somehow, like, go to the prison and give them the evidence or something. You know? Huh. Uh -huh. Not 
nothing new. Let's try and get to Anton's. Grass him up, innit? Snitch. You spend your copious free time poring over what little snippets of news you managed to pick over the last few days. Someone here you call a snitch a grass. Grassed him up. Grassed him up, mate. At this moment, it looks like the crown will be able to weather the storm. The revolution's fire burns, but not brightly enough. Good for you, of course, from all your time in Paris and your close association with Elizabeth. The public believes you to be loyal to the crown. Still, whatever happens next, you can be assured that the ship of state shall come to port. Paris continues to burn. I've done nothing but support the revolution. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Is this our final date, sir? Was that it? Oh wait, don't I have to do it on the map? It was just that I was busy that whole time. Yes, okay, cool. Antoine, I may as well do this. Nothing's going to come close to Mistress Honorado, let's be honest. Following Anton's instructions, you set out for La Grande Tavon de Londres. As thrilled as you are to be meeting him, there's something in the air that makes you feel uncomfortable being out on the streets. Despite all of this, you manage to arrive at the fine eatery without incident. Despite the chaos happening on the streets, the wealthy customers you spy through the windows look carefree, as if they're completely unaware of what's happening in Paris. Antoine steps out of the shadows. Are you ready for a fine meal event? I hope this doesn't get too saucy, because that's going to be ridiculous in the Monty voice. Oh, of course. I've grown to love this place. Ah, oh. oh, you frequent this monarchist establishment, Antoine asks, managing to barely mask his surprise. Oops. He holds the door open for you. Please. After you, madam. You step inside the fine restaurant. It's mahogany tables, crystal chandeliers, and finely dressed staff. The smell alone is enough to make your mouth water. Standing at the door is the maitre d' who bows as you enter. <laughs> oh, bonsoir. Welcome to Le Grand Tavard Londres, home of the finest food outside the halls of Versailles. The well-attired gentleman says at your entrance, How much have you? Eh, yeah, bonsoir to you as well, Antoine says as he pats man on shoulder. Please, no need to bow. We're all just citizens here, no? I believe you should have a reservation for tonight under the name Louis Antoine Louis de Saint Jean. Antoine continues, raising his voice loud enough for other patrons to hear him. Some of them turn their heads. This fine lady and I would love to dine in your elegant establishment. The maitre d's expression sours at this declaration. You can already hear the patrons whispering fiercely amongst each other. That was really you, Monsieur de Saint Jean. I saw the reservation and I assumed it was a tasteless shape. You know, you know our clientele won't tolerate this kind of insult. Ooh. Yeah, how unfortunate. Had I known that our presence was going to be so disquieting, we simply wouldn't have bothered. Antoine replies, which is perhaps the most outrageous lie you've ever heard. Consider this, though. When men dare to whisper my name, they call me one of the most dangerous men in Paris. Mm. You serve as a lickspittle, and I bloody clicked again, and I'm sick of doing it. I'm taking my hand off, mouse. Fine, then I'll prepare your table. That's the other block speaking now, bloody hell. Oh, fine, I'll prepare your table. Just don't cause a scene. You took away my danger. I was talking about how dangerous I am. Dead sexy and that, because I'm a dangerous man. I'm like Batman of Paris, and you skipped it. Unbelievable. Well, that was easy. Um, tonight's going to be amusing. <laughs> that can only hope. After all, the happier we are, the more miserable the other patrons are. And you make me happy indeed. He says, taking your chin between his thumb and forefinger. Here, yeah, come here, you. Boop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your table's right this way. Oh. Anton puts in an order for wine as the incensed host shuffles away, giving only a grunt in reply. The revolutionary turns to you without skipping a beat and says, Last few weeks I've been meeting with a brilliant lawyer here in Paris. One of the first people I've talked to who understands the reality of our situation. To be honest, most of the revolutionaries are in a, in constant as the wind. They know that they're against the aspire, but that's it. Rob, Rob Spire is different. He knows what changes need to be made. He has the chance to unite the people. Next week, he's going to introduce me to his compatriots. When I heard this, I was so excited. I knew I had to tell someone. I saw fit to choose you, because you're one of the few people I trust. It's all very exciting. Oh. I just have no idea how I'm going to say to these luminaries. Um, 
Put forth your most radical thoughts. Don't try to focus on impressing them. Listen. Hmm. I suppose that's the prudent choice, he replies, nodding along. I can't embarrass myself if I'm just listening to what people say. The maitre d' returns. And what would you like to eat? I'm going to have... Duck and turnips. Hmm. That's actually a fine choice. Surprised by your good taste. Well... Anton makes his order as well. The man shuffles away. His pointed efforts not to call attention to you only serve to make you more noticeable. You toast to liberty and a new constitution. The grimacing faces glaring at your table only make the wine taste all the better. There's a joy in having that which is denied to you. Perhaps that's truly why Eve bit the forbidden fruit in Eden. Eventually, with your sumptuous meal complete, you leave the restaurant behind. Night has fallen, shrouding the streets in darkness. However, for all of his smiles... Antoine glances back to the entrance. Make no mistake, that little jape of ours likely just earned us the ire of some of the most despicable people in country. Antoine admits with a chuckle. Let's take a route home that makes us more difficult to follow. You follow him as he deftly weaves your route through all the city's alleys and small places. Towards your home, normally straying from the main streets at night would be outrageously dangerous, but with Antoine you're not the prey. You're, the comp you're in the company of the apex predator. Yeah, ark at me, I'm Apex Predator. How would you like that? Listen. Finally. Finally my moment. You'd think this would have been a Shepherd Crane voice, but it's me. William Pepper slash Monty. It's me moment. The last joke of this evening is I left a sizable sum of coin for that man that waited on us. If nothing else, it feels like fair compensation for him choosing not to poison us then and there. Of course, if looks could kill, I think a fellow diners would have had us broken on the wheel already. Besides, there's something extremely amusing about thought of that man waking up every morning knowing he's gotten more than a whole day's wage from people his masters demand him to hate. Maybe it'll be enough for him to realise just how cheaply he sold his mind and body. <laughs> Bore on, Antoine. Bloody hell. Imagine... I thought this was a date. Come on, son. Woo me, for goodness sake. After a while, you realise you've both been moving exceedingly fast for quite some time. Your new life has prepared you for a lot of things, but extended vigorous exercise wasn't one of them. Gently, you pull on Antoine's hand and he slows the pace, until you're both standing still, breathing heavily in spite of yourselves. All this talk of other people and, uh, I forget myself and what's truly important, he says, the moonlight briefly lighting up his eyes as he looks deep into your own. What is, uh, what is liberty if you don't know what to choose? I thought it was me. I thought you were going to say me, sir. His hand closes around your wrist. I'd like to choose you of it. Oh, finally. And I will choose you when the mood suits me. Don't kiss Antoine. You've chosen wisely. Kiss Antoine. <sighs> I mean, whatever. Your lips meet forcefully as he tightens his grip around you commandingly. His skin is soft and yet there's an overwhelming heat coming off of him. It's like being next to a roaring furnace. You struggle against his grasp, not because you truly wish to break free, but because you like to know that you can't. His hands around your wrist are as unyielding as tempered steel. <laughs> Slowly, achingly, he pulls away from you to look in your eyes. Eventually, you realize you've forgotten to breathe. A few minutes of silence pass, and you can tell that something's weighing heavily upon Antoine's mind. God's sake, mate. I'm still thinking about the revolution. Even now, I can't stop considering our next move. <clears throat> you wanted to focus on just us tonight, and I intend to hold you to that. Perhaps I can help. What's troubling you? I don't care about the revolution anymore. <laughs> Me! You're right. I swore to myself I'd make you my highest priority. I must be a man of my word. Thank you for keeping me honest. Eventually you arrive back at your home. Through the windows you see the candlelit silhouette of Camille as she goes about her last duties. Behind you you feel Antoine's hands slip around your waist. I must go now, he whispers in your ear. I'll call upon you again soon. You have my word. By the time you turn around he's disappeared into the night. Lame date. Lame date. Dude, you talked about the revolution all night. Then, you, then I let you kiss me. And we're going to make that very, very clear. That I let you kiss me even though your date was lame. And then you interrupted our kissing, our hot kissing, to talk about the revolution again. And I told you to make me the focus, and then you walked me home and just whispered in my ear. <sighs> the man has no game. I tell you what. I tell you what. If Alex was here, 
that man knew how to date, okay? Gone too soon, sweet Alex. I wonder if there's a way to keep him alive, because, like, he had game. You know? Antoine, like Elizabeth, a royal painter, hiding our relationship from her husband, painting me nude, has more game than you, sir. You're meant to be a dangerous revolutionary, the most dangerous man in Paris to everything but me, mate. To everything but my my dignity, you know? Dangerous to everything but what really matters. <laughs> my heart. By the time you turn around, he's disappeared into the night. Mm-hmm. He'd be a terrible enemy. Glad to have his heart in my hand. Puppet master. The quickened beating of your heart pales in comparison to the racing of your mind. All of Paris is a chessboard and is taking the willpower you can muster just to stay a few moves ahead of everyone else. Because part of this is meant to be that you can just woo people and control them and your your goal is, you know, whatever you want, become queen or whatever it is, you know. Which is why there's options like that. Does it all have to be romance? Sometimes you're just playing them like a fiddle. No one got game like Madame Gazelle. Dun, dun, dun. Let's just sleep and see if anything pops up or if the game ends. The violence in Paris has only gotten worse, which is often the case in times lying these. Judging from the frantic murmurings you hear in the street, it's confirmed the crown is more powerful than the revolution. How? What? Literally all I did was boost the revolution and constantly be told that the revolution was really powerful. How many times did it tell us that the revolution was more powerful? But now not when we entered this chapter. Of course, rarely does one group hold power alone. The minor factions of France are finally picking sides. The church is supporting the crown. The church is diminished versus years past, but the, all the same, blah, blah, blah. The bourgeoisie have fallen in line behind the revolution in a weak and disorderly fashion. The military with the crown, and Paris continues to burn. Bet Ludovico had more game. I don't know. I feel like Ludovico's like almost the opposite, like we would feel like Madame Gazelle, right? Corrupting him. Like, what do you have? What relationships is like... Anton is like super, like passionate, the kind of, what is it? The Sundare, like sort of the people say the anime relationship style or whatever. Madame Gazelle's obviously a dom. And then... Elizabeth is like this forbidden, like, secret love. Two women together. It's very soft. It's very caring. It's very supportive. Um, Alex was, like, really fun, but then they kill him off. Like, his date was actually so smooth. So we have no idea what he's like, actually, on a deeper level. And so then I feel like all that's left is for Ludovico to be, like, really simpy, almost, you know? With those eyes. But hey, maybe he would have shocked us. I don't know. Shimpy, shimpy boy. <laughs> also, yeah, that voice, that would have been, uh, that would have made for some interesting scenes. For the kissing, I guess. Last year in October, a large crowd of women marched upon Versailles to demand bread, mostly armed with homemade pikes. This crowd was disjointed and sporadic, many deserting upon seeing the armed guards at the, pal the palace. When the demands went unanswered, the mob attempted to storm the palace to present their demands to the royal family. In response, the guards opened fire, dispersing the crowd with force. Revolutionaries have come to refer to this tragic event as the Women's Massacre. This sudden violence began a string of defeats that the revolution is reeling from to this day. The crown has the stability and necessary alliances to suppress any threat to their power as soon as they arise, preventing them from gaining momentum. Paranoia and desertion have withered the revolutionary ranks. The crown recently released an edict of mercy promising legal clemency to any revolutionary that throws down their arms. This edict excludes all that have been branded as leaders. Paris continues to burn. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Yes, yeah, so you have. <laughs> Just lean fully into it. Last night, a sleepy commune named Varane has made history. The two years have been a collection of sporadic uprisings and spells. One looks who appears to France leaves as Paris continues to burn. Oh. 
La guillotine. People in the Discord said Alex survives sometimes if you don't meet him before the riots. I joined the Discord to see if people had the same issues. Ah. I mean, it's weird that we can still date him, but he's dead. Like, there's definitely something weird going on. A device that will decapitate the condemned quickly and cleanly. No longer they twist and choke at the end of a hangman's rope. No longer will a miss strike from the executioner's blade. Leave a screaming man begging for a second swing. This guillotine kills instantly. Okay. It's been a year and a half. Like, why am I just getting six cutscenes in, in a row? It's been a year and a half. The people of France have warmed to the guillotine. The courts have been held in a situation of complete legal deadlock. Captured revolutionary leaders continue to argue their case before the courts. Finally, His Majesty broke the deadlock by ordering their executions by royal decree. One after another, revolutionary leaders are executed, their heads stacked in rows upon the ground. Jeering crowds stamped upon revolutionary cockades and shouted, Vive la Rue! with every death. The king had once again been accused of possessing and vacillating nature had he not formally kept his hands upon the reins of power. Like, we're just, time is just flying now. I guess I'm seeing everything that I did, the history play out. Your morning preparations are interrupted by the sound of loud crashes and discontent outside. Ever since the crown put down the rebellion that threatened to usurp his majesty, you'd heard of disloyal subjects being put on trial. You look out the window and see dragoons tearing people from their homes, gathering in the middle of the street. Your blood runs cold at the sound of a heavy fist banging against the front door. I'll get it, Camille calls out from downstairs. Before you can stop her, you hear her opening the front door. This is immediately muffled by the sounds of a struggle. You stir at the sound of tramping boots. Someone is coming up the stairs. A familiar trick came bursts in to notice to his hands. Hey, it's me. Corporal Aubergine. Huh. Madame Yvette de Cal, you stand accused of high crimes against his majesty the king. Uh, give me a moment to... You gasp. He grabs you roughly by the wrist in the middle of your sentence and starts dragging you outside. Your attempts to bargain with him fall on deaf ears. Before he drags you out of your bedroom, you manage to grab your traveling bag. It contains your journal, a pencil, along with a mysterious letter and a signet ring. Not long afterwards, you find yourself alone in a jail cell. You try to contemplate which indignity is greater. The fact you're still only dressed in your foundation garments or the fact you still haven't had breakfast yet. Taking a seat on your new bed, you wonder what this trial will be like. How does one even prove their loyalty to the crown? You do know one thing, though. Whatever awaits you in the trial, you must succeed. Your very life hangs in the balance. Elizabeth, darling, I love you. I don't know her. I don't know her. Elizabeth, please. <laughs> <laughs> Calling it now. The next morning, you find yourself dragged into a crowded courtroom. It takes a second to realize it's most of the people you've seen at once in weeks. Looking around, you survey the crowd, feeling rare flashes of familiarity at some of their faces. It's likely you've seen them at various splendid parties over the years. Has it really been that long? Your life in Paris feels like it's flown by, does it? Yet by it feels eons from your life in the country. A judge at the front of the courthouse clears his throat, jolting you from your referee. Ah oh, yes, you're supposed to be dissuading them from making your head shorter. That's why you're here. Oh, oh this guy again. Pay attention, everyone. Return to your seats. I shall have order in my courtroom. Ah. The case we have before us is quite out of the ordinary. Still, I should not allow this folly to sully the decency of these proceedings. Madame Yvette de Coe, you stand accused of leading a conspiracy against His Majesty King Louis. This is a high crime indeed. I... Like, I'm fine for this ending to play out, but reg whatever happens, I'm not going to feel like it's deserved, because up until that third chapter, all I've done is pro-revolution. I, I don't know how we're at this ending. I don't know why I'm arrested. Leading a conspiracy against the king, you've done a lot of questionably legal, questionably legal things, but this isn't one of them. What's going on here? Should you be found guilty? The judge continues sternly. You shall be sentenced to death. How do you plead? I'm um, sure this is the first time I've even heard of these. First of all, madam, you shall address me as your honor. Second of all, ignorance of the law is no excuse. The charges against you still stand. Pro-revolution would be against the crown. No, but I mean in terms of the... It said the revolution was massively more powerful than the crown. Whenever we checked. I don't know how the crown suddenly won. Like, we should be getting the revolutionary ending. We should be, like, marching in the streets and stuff. Hmm. Thank you, Your Honor. The prosecutor says as he strides into the center of the room with a practiced ease. I'm Antoine Fouquier Tinville, and it's my duty to bring the enemies within our midst to justice. Yeah. The woman who stands before you is a well-known associate of the traitorous revolutionary Louis-Antoine de Saint-Jean. 
charged with scheming with foreign agents and leading a group of revolutionary fanatics. Yes. Where's our fourth war? At this declaration, the jury gasps and mutters darkly amongst themselves. It appears that being especially close to a well-known militant revolutionary may not have been the safest choice. I only kissed him twice. He was a terrible date. Let me go. Bloody hell, my peril! Oh no! Oh god! Instead of living at peace within the bosoms of our kingdom, which had provided her sustenance, and instead of obeying the laws, she instead plotted it against his majesty and the king, and against the Frankish people themselves. The dong. Madame de Coe, is it true you were engaged to Baron Armand de Gamachwam? I was, but I haven't seen him in months. Oh. Really? Uh -huh. My question was merely if you were engaged to the man. However, I must say I find your sudden denial to be quite damning. I would posit that despite your denial, you'd naturally be familiar with your own fiancé's activities, yet not once you did you attempt to alert anyone to his treasonous actions. That alone is enough to suggest you work to conceal his fanatical aims. The jury murmurs darkly. Ah. I believe I've heard enough of this. What? My peril went to 100 and that's it. I have to come in here with like zero peril. Somebody help. Honorade, Elizabeth, anyone? Your heart sinks as you watch the jury turn to each other and whisper to themselves. They don't even bother to leave the room. After a scant few minutes, the speaker of the jury says we find the defendant guilty. Hello? Where's my uh, where's my allies? You are found guilty of high crimes against the people of France for your crimes. I sentence you to death. If I don't see Honorade again... The next day it's raining. You're barefoot, being led to the guillotine. And it's raining. When you first came to Paris, this monstrous device didn't even exist. Now it hangs over all of France. Like the fabled sword of Damocles. The promise of instant death. Hanging by but a thread. In your position, some fanciful poet would take this time to claim this rain is a metaphor for tears, that the heavens themselves weep at your loss. You're far too intelligent for such a notion. Feels familiar in a way. You can hear people in the crowd jubilantly celebrating your downfall like the night when you exposed Marcel's nobility for the sham that it was. For most of these people don't really know who you are. All they know is you reach too high above your station and they hate you for it. Seeing you die will make them feel less small to the devil with them and their feelings. You reach the base of the scaffold and the executioner approaches you to spout some meaningless words to bind your hands. This is so you don't convulse too dreadfully when you die. You ignore his advice. What could he possibly have to say that would be of any use to you? His entire calling is ending lives. Yours was living one. With your hands bound together, someone prods you in the back with something pointed. You begin to ascend the steps of the scaffold. The texture of the warped wood is almost sharp against the soles of your bare feet. Your toes curl over the edge of the rickety steps. You look out upon the crowd. Their faces contorted grotesquely in the process of uttering their petty boos and jeers. After a whole life spent climbing even higher, this latest ascent of yours may have drawn your biggest crowd yet. It's all about to end. But is this really that bad? In your short time, you managed to live more than nearly anyone who has ever decried you. Born a common girl, you became in you become in <coughs> Born a common girl, you became engaged nobility. Growing up in the country, you finally managed to move to Paris. Within days of arriving, you attended a party grander than anything you'd ever seen, only to be betrayed. Bereft of hope, you were rescued by a mysterious widow. Where is she now? Is that not the stuff that stories are made of? With a sharp tongue and a mind full of rumours, you secretly became a journalist, journalist for the most notorious newspaper in all of Paris. Seeking a truly poetic revenge, you uncovered the long hidden secrets of a fake noble woman who had humiliated you, tricked a woman who wielded her title as a weapon into selling her own hubris proclamations against herself. She dared humiliate you and you brought her to ruin. You dove into an ever-flowing river of life and culture that surpassed everything you'd ever dreamed of in the countryside. Despite it all, you remained loyal to Armand, the very reason you came to Paris. Did I? Handsome, fun, witty, he shared in your love of ambition itself. He always felt that somehow things could be better. It was pure and truly noble. Then the people, driven mad with hunger and powerlessness, laid siege to the Bastille, a prison that stood for every wicked thing. You soon watched the burning embers of revolution get snuffed out. No amount of desire and yearning makes something come to pass. Only action has such a power. Any last words, madam? The executioner asks. A pox upon you and upon these people, very Shakespearean. May your whole world turn to ashes. My only crime 
is I lived as few dared to dream. I suppose it's too late to tell you that I'm innocent, no? <laughs> you just know it's going to do that right after you say it. Too late to tell you I'm innocent, darling. <laughs> A pox upon you. Spiteful until the very end, I see. You truly are the wicked woman they say you to be. Of course they call you wicked. They call you wicked because they envy you. They call you wicked because seeing you soar to greater and greater heights only reminds them how small they have let themselves become. How strange. You'd always assumed if you were to be killed, it would be for something that you actually deserved. You'd foreseen so many possibilities, but innocence wasn't really one of them. A hand is placed on your shoulder and you're forced to your knees. A yoke is placed around your neck and a basket in front of your face. The humble wicker container is stained the colour of rust, baptised in the blood of revolutionaries and martyrs. At least your beautiful head shall come to rest in suitable company. The blade raises, the crowd hushes. It feels like time itself has come to a halt. Perhaps things could have been different. Perhaps with a tiny decision here, a minor correction there, your great ambitions could have been achieved. Perhaps. Of course, while your own story comes to its close, the stories of others continue to be written or are tragically cut short. In fact, your life was cut short, but at least it was done in a suitably grand fashion. After all, history is filled with those who never bothered to reach very far and yet were killed for it anyway. You even managed to outlast Armand for a time. However, even though you've left this mortal coil behind, the rest of Paris marches on. Elizabeth, the great painter haunted by the malaise that sapped her inspiration and stifled her heart, who didn't come to your aid at all during the court trial and really don't care what happened to her. With the nobility's victory of the revolutionaries, Paris eventually returned to something resembling normalcy. However, Elizabeth struggles with both her path scandals and a dearth of artistic inspiration. Ludovico, the priest, pushed into the clergy against his will, who struggled with a higher calling that pulled against his desire to have the love and happiness afforded to the parishioners he himself led in prayer. Back in Rome, he was happy to watch the nobility maintain their grip on power, as it prevented the revolutionaries from bringing more bloodshed to an already troubled country. He spends his days sending petitions, urging his majesty to use his newfound stability as an opportunity to alleviate the suffering and starvation so rife amongst the common people. He has yet to receive a reply. My queen, Honorade, the opulent and domineering widow who still grieved openly for her husband Charles who passed away all those years ago. Despite her attempts to urge her associates in the bourgeoisie to oppose the nobility's stranglehold on power wherever possible, the revolution was crushed regardless. Charged with sedition, she managed to narrowly avoid the guillotine when you helped her hire one of the best defense attorneys in the country. Did I? Well, she lives on. Antoine, the fiery revolutionary who would stop at nothing to bring liberty to France. From the beginning, he burned with an ardor that threatened to become a raging inferno. When the revolution's initial uprising failed, Antoine was one of the first on the Anchorajon list of enemies. With your assistance, he escaped Paris before they could arrest him. Did he? Very few of the other revolutionary leaders were so lucky. <laughs> Pierre, of course, survived the unfaithful. He's just telling me things I haven't even done. Men like him have always been well equipped to survive anything that fortune might throw their way. Honest men may find themselves ill-prepared in times of unease, but dishonest ones are quite used to facing danger at every turn. He may have been seen toasting to the victory of the nobility and tradition. He's also been heard grousing to himself about renewed harsh censorship. Fatima, the dressmaker. After the nobility's close call with consequences for their excesses, there's been a renewed interest in personal protection. More and more clients have been requesting Fatima uses tightly stitched layers of silk to add armor. At least it's likely to work if an assassin in question agrees to use a silk dagger. And Camille! Yeah, where were you? Your indefatigable handmaiden. Seen by your side ever since your first moments in Paris. Camille was deeply saddened by your passing. Hmm, sad. She had a great turn of fortune when the landlord of the house fled Paris to avoid prosecution for his list of financial crimes. With no one to claim the building, Camille became its de facto owner. So at least there's that. While your own story is cut short, the story of the world continues unabated. Something comforting in the thought. No single person's death is enough to halt the march of its history. And as always in Paris, life goes on. Well, we made it through. I mean, we got an ending. I think something is very, very wrong with that playthrough. We just seem to get stuck in chapter two with nothing triggering. And then... Uh, and then, like, everything just happened that didn't happen, so. I still enjoyed it, you know. 
a little bit of filth, a little bit of titillation here and there. Um, some fun moments for a bit of blushing and, oh, scandalous, you know. And also making fun of terrible dates.